We are in a golden age of women's wrestling right now. Watching women not only in the WWE, but across promotions all around the world, finally being promoted as equals to the men. We're seeing women main event wrestling's biggest event of the year, WrestleMania. We're seeing big all women stables being heavily pushed like damage control. We're seeing Lita and Becky Lynch as the first two women wrestlers on a billboard in Saudi Arabia ever. And we're seeing some of the absolute best matches each and every single week coming out of the women. I'm sure I'm not the only one who'd agree that at this year's Rumble, the women's outshine the men's. That final six. And not to mention at Elimination Chamber in Perth last month, which I got to go to. <laughs> a women's match was the pre-show dark match, the opening match of the entire event, as well as the main event closer. Can you even imagine WWE doing that only five years ago? With the time of Vince McMahon's possessive hold on the WWE and thereby the entire wrestling industry finally passing and people like Triple H, Stephanie McMahon and Shawn Michaels having a huge say in the creative direction of the company and its storylines, we are finally seeing women's wrestling just blast through every single glass ceiling that has been placed upon them since wrestling's beginning and history is actively being made each and every week. Starting from the likes of China to Trish and Lita, to Mickey James, to Beth Phoenix, Natalia, Victoria, Michelle McCool, Melina, and now the four horsewomen, to Rhea Ripley, Bianca Belair, Liv Morgan, still Natalia, Io Sky, Indy Hartwell, Tiffany Stratton, because it's Tiffy time, and those vocal pipes of Samantha Irvin, it has never been a better time to get into professional wrestling. Well, well, well. What a video you've decided to click on today. A fantastic choice, I'd say, brother. And don't worry, two minutes and I'm already just like totally ashamed of myself and making a Hogan reference considering I'm here to talk positively about women. Hey, I'm Luz and uh, welcome to the video. About a year ago now, I went on a nice little girls trip a few hours away for a weekend where we absolutely didn't take acid, but we absolutely did do a power presentation night. And you know what my topic was. Actually, I'd be surprised if you guessed wrong, considering you've already clicked on this video, you've uh, seen the title, the thumbnail, but I'll tell you anyway. My topic was women's wrestling and the incredible strides women in the wrestling industry have taken over the last two decades to prove themselves as equal to the men. And boy, oh boy, was it rough going for a while. Among the other topics was the consistency, both physical and time related, of her friend's poops during a South America trip and a TLDR on Taylor Swift. Let's just say I potentially overprepared and my presentation lasted around an hour because I couldn't shut the fuck up about women's wrestling and why it's the goddamn best. I mean, look, it's rare that I can shut the fuck up in the first place. Why do you think I've started a YouTube channel? But get me started on wrestling. Oh boy, somebody better put me in a crossface ASAP. And I pray to God it's Sasha. So here I finally am recreating and extending that original fabled PowerPoint presentation that was originally done in a strange Airbnb that seemed like a swingers getaway spot, which I saw in real time make my girlfriends not only start to understand and appreciate wrestling, I mean, honestly, all I had to do was show them Rhea Ripley, seriously, but convince them to watch the next WWE pay-per-view with me and come to local Melbourne City wrestling shows with me. I sincerely hope you will enjoy this insanity fueled deep dive into the history of women's wrestling that you're about to consume from me. And I also hope that whether you're a hardcore wrestling fan, not at all, or maybe you watched it when you were young and you just kind of lost interest over time, that you'll leave this video wanting to watch one of the many top tier women's matches I'm going to suggest and having a true appreciation for the incredible work that every single women's wrestler has done for their industry across so many decades. I basically want this video to be a history book that people can look through to get up to date, to understand the history and to acknowledge those who paved the way. Something you can link to a friend to convince them to watch WrestleMania with you without having to explain all the background info and significance of it all yourself. In saying that though, I will acknowledge now, this video is about WWE and their history of women's wrestling. AEW, TNA, Joshi Wrestling, they'll get some mentions throughout, but ultimately, it ain't what we're here to talk about today. Before we get into the promised insanity, I'm gonna spend the next however long it takes to explain some important wrestling terminology that I'll be using throughout the video, as well as some general background info on wrestling as an industry for those of you who might be new to all of this. 
If you're a hardcore wrestling fan, the next however long may not be for you. You might be like, Lauren, why the fuck are you explaining what a bump is to me, you fucking mark? Well, to that I say, why are you being so mean to me? I'm just trying to make a video that will help get more women into wrestling. And also feel free to skip to the timestamp you see on the screen now. Okay, now that those Reddit mods have finally left us alone for the next little while, it's time for Wrestling Terminology 101. Get out your notepads and pens. This will be on the test. No, 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 not the rest of the test. Like on the test that I'm doing like in half an hour, like quick, like all of your grade counts for this. If you don't get this right, you won't be graduating. So like. To answer the first question any non-wrestling fan asks. No, wrestling is not fake. Wrestling is choreographed. Yes, the winner of the match is already decided beforehand, it is scripted, but that does not make it fake. The moves are real and the wrestlers are actually getting hurt and taking bumps, which is to fall on the mat or ground. Right now, there are like three women out with a torn ACL, which is an extremely painful injury with a nine month healing period. Even something like running the ropes, which is where you run up to the ring ropes and you lean back and you bounce off can be extremely painful, especially for a smaller bodied wrestler. Those things are screwed in tight for the big boy. So when you're small and you smack your whole weight, bam, into some thick cabled ropes that are barely giving weight for you, ouch. Wrestlers are taking real hits to their bodies and there is nothing in this sport that is fake except for the entertainment side of it. For wrestlers in the WWE, they are sometimes wrestling up to five nights a week. Not only is there the televised Raw, SmackDown, NXT, or almost monthly pay-per-views, which are now known as PLEs, premium live events, and no, I'm not calling them that, but WWE tour around America and the world and do untelevised house shows as well. Many wrestlers have active injuries that they continue to wrestle with. It's why opioid addiction has been such a mainstay throughout the industry. My shoulder's killing me, and I probably need to have surgery and take nine months off, but I'm just finally starting to get some wind under me and gain some fans and traction with the WWE and the show must go on. So what if I leave for nine months and no one remembers me or my booking gets worse? Booking being a scheduled match or appearance on a wrestling show. You can be booked good. You can be booked bad. You can be not booked at all. Some people barely wrestle for months, but are still booked on each and every show purely because their presence in a segment backstage or not can keep fans watching. You can see this in Rhea Ripley's title reign the last year where after a brilliant match with Charlotte Flair at WrestleMania, which holy shit, put that on your to watch list right now. She's only defended her title a handful of time on pay-per-views, but has been a mainstay across almost every single live WWE program since. Mommy's presence alone is enough to keep fans watching, especially this newer generation of young women who are tuning in for her. I think a really useful word to describe wrestling to someone who doesn't fully understand it is that it's a performance. And one that is camp as hell. Don't know what camp is? I can try and give you a little explanation, but honestly, its interpretation can vary person to person. Camp is a feeling. Camp is anticipation. Susan Sontag in her book titled Notes on Camp says, quote, the hallmark of camp is the spirit of extravagance. It's an exaggerated performance or art aesthetic with an air of irony or tackiness or playfulness, oftentimes a bit outrageous or inappropriate. It feeds off its own ridiculousness and can sometimes even offend those who don't understand what the performer is trying to do. This makes more sense when you learn that professional wrestling as entertainment originated from traveling carnivals, carnies. All this is not to say that wrestling is a joke at all. The existence of irony or silliness in camp isn't there to negate any real emotion or storytelling, but instead leans into its own ridiculousness and stories it paints and uses this unique storytelling device to make those real emotions even more exaggerated. Whether the serious ones or the silly ones, or sometimes both at the same time. It's larger than life, it's not always believable, but you suspend your disbelief regardless. With that, let's start with what I think is one of the most important wrestling terminology words to properly understand the art form as it is, as a whole, kayfabe. 
Kayfabe is the portrayal of staged events within the industry as real or true. Yes, Leader and Trish, who were last week best friends tagging together, now absolutely loathe each other and really want to beat each other up. Yes, the custody of a young Dominic Mysterio really was decided by the winner of a ladder match between Rey Mysterio and Eddie Guerrero. Yeah, Mae Young really did give birth to a hand. Wait, what? Yes, The Undertaker really is some sort of undead being who could be controlled by an urn filled with ashes. Or is he? But God, didn't just believing it make his character truly larger than life? The Undertaker was so dedicated to his role that until his recent retirement, he never broke character. If you saw him in person, at the airport, wherever, he was always dressed in all black. He kept his kayfabe character alive everywhere he went, and it's not until recently since he's retired that we've gotten to consume a huge amount of media of him just being Mark Calloway. And then you get to go see him doing a one-man show and make fun of the audience for asking shitty questions and tell us all stories from his career like the take a tattoo titty girl. If you know, you know. I know. With the introduction of social media, it's been interesting to see the way kayfabe has grown with it. WWE superstars often walk the line between keeping kayfabe alive on their social medias and not. Some of them just straight up do both. One post is their currently heel persona being a douchebag talking shit on another wrestler, then the next a nice photo of them and their real life partner on a nice date. With the ability to find out everything you want about a wrestler's personal life now, it's up to you, in addition to their storytelling abilities, to believe what they're selling you on TV each week. A character like The Undertaker and its believability was such an essence of its time. You've always had to suspend your disbelief, but nowadays I'd say even more so. This is sometimes why I think that people can find pro wrestling cringe at first. It's a very unique piece of entertainment. You probably noticed I used the word heel in that explanation. And you can't have a heel without a face, aka the good guy and the bad guy. With storytelling being such a fundamental aspect of professional wrestling, it always comes down to the simplicity of good versus bad. You need someone to root for and someone you want to lose. A face, or a baby face, is the morally right character. They do things by the books, they're generally smiley, they fight for what's right, they make you want to cheer them on, they high five the fans on the way to the ring. They're like the superhero. A heel, well. They don't give a fuck what you think and really just couldn't care less about making you like them. They'll cheat, they'll use outside interference to win, they'll badmouth their opponents and the fans. They're like the villain. And this is supposed to be something that anyone suddenly turning on the TV to tune in can understand immediately. So you see it in their wrestling style, their outfits, their taunts, even the way they walk to the ring. Some of the most entertaining moments in wrestling storytelling is a really good unexpected heel turn, where one of the good guys turns on their friends and starts a path of destruction. I'm a heel girl, if you can't tell. <laughs> Next up, a tag team or a stable. These mostly speak for themselves, but a tag team is two wrestlers who partner and wrestle together, and a stable is a group of wrestlers who align themselves together. Some of the most notable tag teams and stables of all time and right now are The Hardy Boys, The Judgment Day, DX, Edge and Christian, Damage Control, The Bloodline, Evolution, NWO, The Dudley Boys, The Heart Foundation, The Divas of Doom, Lay Cool, The New Day, The Shield, Rated RKO, and fucking so many more. Valet or manager? Oftentimes a woman, but not always, a wrestler's valet or manager is someone who accompanies them everywhere they go. They walk them to the ring, they stand by the ring during matches, if they're a heel duo they'll often interfere with said matches, they cut promos with them, they have storylines together, they help amp up the importance of the wrestlers they're supporting. For a long time, they were mostly just some eye candy. Hot girl, big boob with big strong man, wow, he must be very important and desirable. Promo. A hugely important aspect of being a professional wrestler is that you gotta be fucking hot on the mic. To cut a promo is to speak in a dialogue or as a monologue either to the crowd, the camera, another wrestler, or on socials to advance a storyline. You cannot have pro wrestling without the promos. You need to create reasons for why the audience should care about you in your matches. Pro wrestling is entertainment and wrestling mixing. It's rare that someone can make it to the top of the company while being a great wrestler, 
but bad on the mic. If anything, you'll more often see someone make it higher who's an average wrestler, but killer on the mic. It's all about star power and getting yourself over. Over. There's being over or there's putting someone else over. If you're over in wrestling, you're achieving the desired crowd reaction that you're after with the audience buying into you as a performer or your gimmick. Faces who are over will be cheered and heels who are over will be booed. To be honest, heels who are over will also often be cheered as well. That's just how it is. To put someone over, it means that you do something to make them look really good and accomplish the crowd reaction they want. You'll often see this at times where a newer wrestler gets to work with an established fan favorite and the tenured wrestler gets the newer one hype and attention just by their presence alone, but also often by ultimately losing to them eventually to build up the other person's status and make them look strong. All wrestlers aim to not only be over with the crowd, but over with WWE backstage. It just basically means they like you and will want to push you. A push meaning getting given more bookings, likely more wins as well, and being put into more storylines. They're literally giving you a push to the fans. Selling. Oh boy, this is one of my favorite things about wrestling. Selling is basically the act of making wrestling look believable to the audience. It's making it look like that forearm to the back is as painful as it looks, even if it isn't. It's making it look like you're really struggling to make it over to your tag partner to tag them in, but at the last second you jump up for the anticipated hot tag. It is simply acting as though the moves that are happening to you hurt. In opposition to this, there's also no cells. This could be intentional for storytelling, having the tiny Rey Mysterio chop the huge big show and he doesn't feel it, or it could be the actions of real life tension backstage where a wrestler refuses to make their opponent look good. No one likes the sandbagger. A few of my favorite sellers include Mickey James, Randy Orton, Shawn Michaels, and AJ Lee. I just love anyone who's willing to crumple and makes it look smooth as butter. Heat. Yes. Another of my favorite things. I'm a natural heel lover. If someone can come up with a persona that is so, let's say troublesome, that it makes thousands of people boo them, God, it's just so fucking fun to watch. And that's what heat is, a negative reaction that a wrestler gets from a crowd in a performance setting. The boos, the you suck chants, that's delicious heat. And in expansion to that, there's things like cheap heat, which depending on how you play it can be fantastic or just boring. An example of cheap heat is if like, I'm a Melbourne wrestler, but I'm in Sydney and I walk out to the crowd microphone in hand and I say, what a terrible day it is for me to be back in this shithole of a city that people call Sydney. Cue the booze, easy, cheap, sometimes fun, especially if they're playing a real shithead heel, other times lazy. If you want to watch some of the most incredible heat anyone's had in a long time, you should go watch any of Dominic Mysterio's promos from the last year. That man cannot say two words without getting drowned out with booze. But there's more. There's real heat, which means there's tension between wrestlers in real life or between the wrestlers and management. You never want real heat. That means people are fucking mad at you and you might be getting punished. Squash. Just like the name suggests, it's an extremely one-sided match where someone basically just gets squashed. One wrestler dominates the other and quickly defeats them with virtually no resistance. It can be used to put a wrestler over and make them look extremely strong. It has been used to punish wrestlers who management aren't happy with. I don't know how I feel about squashes. I think if you're gonna do one, it has to make sense and be believable for both the wrestlers' characters, and it can't be overdone. Main event. The main event of a show is generally the last match on the card and is the one that is advertised as the headlining match. It is most often the match that has the most important stars or storylines at the time involved. Pretty self-explanatory. Okay. I think we're done with the lesson. If you have any further questions, please save them until after class and either Google or myself in the comment section can help you out. And now, for the benefit of those with flash photography, I call this pose. Let's get into the goddamn video. <laughs> Mm, 
nah, we're skipping this. There's too much to talk about and I just don't think anything from this era is completely relevant. There were women in wrestling at this time and there were a few making history, but I just don't believe there's any legacies here that are actively bleeding into the women's revolution of today. I will give a shout out to Mae Young, Alundra Blaze, and Bull Nakano, the fabulous Mula can suck a fuck. I suppose I will mention that at this time, WWE was still called WWF, the World Wrestling Federation. Potentially the most well-known and remembered era of wrestling, the Attitude Era was when WWE hit the mainstream and was showing the entire world that wrestling not only existed, but that it was bad fucking ass. The Monday Night Wars had begun and the at the time called WWF were fighting for viewership with WCW and ECW and it was time to do things differently and turn everything up to the maximum. The language got ruder, the aggression got aggressivia, and things got hot and steamy. And holy shit, was it so fun to watch. They were completely accomplishing their goals of attracting a young adult audience, leaning into shock value humor, as well as an incredibly grunge aesthetic that suited the 90s perfectly. The way the WWE influenced both mine and my brother's music taste growing up, goddamn. Animal I Have Become by Three Days Grace was genuinely my top four most listened to song in my 2023 Spotify wrapped. So I know that's a different era, but still, <laughs> the music, has always, and well, until recently, been epic. This era was defined by the likes of Stone Cold Steve Austin, Shawn Michaels and Triple H and DX, The Undertaker, Kane, The McMahon Family, Mick Foley, The Rock, The Hart Family, the hugely famous Hell in a Cell match between Mick Foley, known then as Mankind, and The Undertaker where Mick was choke slammed off the top of the cage down into the announce table about 20 feet below was held during this time in 1998. A huge staple of women existing in wrestling at this time was to look good, accompany male wrestlers to the ring, and most often date them in kayfabe. I won't talk about what was going on backstage. Women were wrestling at this time, but they were never held in the same regard as the men and had been graciously given the title of divas rather than superstars as christened by Sable. Women's matches were incredibly short and very often cut for time and most often weren't even real matches but were instead bikini contests or bra and panties matches. But that didn't stop the women of the time from paving the way for the WWE we see today. Stars like Chyna, Sable, Lita, Trish Stratus, Stephanie McMahon, Ivory, Sunny, Stacey Keebler, Terry Runnels, Tori Wilson, Jacqueline, Molly Holly, Mae Young, and Lillian Garcia were absolute staples for the Attitude Era. This was an interesting time for women's wrestling, where you saw most of the Divas roster often only there as eye candy or with a man beside them, wrestling in matches like the ingeniously named evening gown match, where the first person to strip their opponent of their clothes would be the winner. Many of the WWF Divas weren't actual wrestlers and were instead models or cheerleaders that were picked up and trained while they were valeting for the men at the time. The WWF were only seeking women to fill the spot of being sexy on TV rather than being competent wrestlers. But then you also saw the likes of China and Lita. We'll get to those two in a minute. Let's talk about Sable. Sable fit the exact mold that the WWF wanted at the time for their Divas. Blonde, big boobed, skinny, and willing to undress for the world to see. And honestly, it was working. Sable was finding herself just as famous as her male co-stars and her sex appeal was just as responsible for the cementing of the Attitude Era's outrageousness as Stone Cold's fuck you attitude. A one-time women's champion, Sable competed in matches that were mostly centered around opportunities to get her to undress. Both matches where she won the title and then lost it were the aforementioned evening gown matches. Fun, huh? Can you imagine any of the women's matches today being decided in some sort of softcore porn disguised as a wrestling match? But Sable played her part well and soon became bigger than the WWF, not only getting spots on TV shows, but being on the cover of Playboy magazine twice in the same year. In almost complete mirrored opposition to the likes of Sable, we had the incredible China. 
the ninth wonder of the world. With a history of bodybuilding and coming in with a stature of almost five foot nine, China looked nothing like the skinny, blonde-haired models that saturated the industry. She was brought in by Triple H and Shawn Michaels as Degeneration X's bodyguard, after some hard-fought convincing of Vince McMahon who thought that a woman being a bodyguard wasn't believable. But she was an instant hit, perfectly fitting in with the absolutely outrageous and crass group that was DX. They were a group of troublemakers, to put it nicely. I'd lovingly call them an annoying group of dickheads. Fuck me, they were good at it. And it felt like the perfect place China could belong with their fuck you attitude and an ability to turn anything and everything into sexual innuendo. China helped push the uniqueness that the stable had that kept people tuning in each week and played the perfect, no nonsense, badass straight man while Sean and Triple H amped up the mischief. In October of 1999, at the pay-per-view No Mercy, China became the Intercontinental Champion, a man championship, by defeating Jeff Jarrett in what was dubbed a good housekeeping match after we weeks of being ridiculed by Jarrett saying that women belonged in the kitchen. Love that for her. To this day, China is the only woman to win the Intercontinental Championship, let alone any other championship that wasn't strictly a women's or diva's belt. And she went on to do it a second time. China was not only keeping up with the boys, but she was dominating them. She had the height, the muscle mass, and a brilliant badass attitude in her promos. She was the first woman to ever enter a Royal Rumble, and Although she was eliminated in under a minute, she managed to eliminate the huge Mark Henry by herself. Talk about being over. Over with the crowd, I'll clarify. China had a lot of heat backstage from the men who didn't think she had any right to be inside the ring with them. <clears throat> Whatever. But the crowd, they loved her. Bleacher Report said it best. For the first time, a woman proved she could hang with the men in lengthy, quality championship matches. She also broke the mold of thin, skinny, model-looking women and paved the way for the likes of Beth Phoenix and Karma, aka Awesome Kong, to be hired by the biggest sports entertainment company in the world. I think one of my favorite things about China is that although she was this tall, muscly antithesis of a diva, she was still an entire woman. She presented herself sexually and with femininity. She proved that it didn't have to be one or the other. You could be anything and everything you wanted all in one. You could power bomb the fuck out of a man filled to the brim with steroids and opioids, then be a part of a hilarious segment talking about your new boob job. And God, her storyline with the late great Eddie Guerrero. Alexa, play here without you by three doors down. It was so great to see China be able to have fun and be flirted with and laughed during segments, be a part of brilliant matches against men and women, and still be shown as a woman to be desired. There are so many comparisons to draw between the likes of Sable and China, despite their entirely different personalities and positions within the company. Ultimately, both were typecasted, given ceilings, and treated with disrespect backstage. They both shot for Playboy and left the WWE on bad terms, where Sable, who after leaving in June 99, filed a $110 million lawsuit against the company, citing allegations of sexual harassment and unsafe working conditions. Although Sable did return several years later with not much of her on-screen character changing. To paint an even broader image of the way women were regarded at the time, this was an era where Stephanie McMahon, the daughter of CEO Vince McMahon, was written into several storylines of her dating or marrying wrestlers, including absolutely batshit insane things like being abducted by The Undertaker and forced into an unholy wedding, which was revealed to be a setup by Vince himself. She was then set to on-screen marry another wrestler test, only for it to be revealed that she was drugged by Triple H and forced to marry him already. Coincidentally, the two did actually get married in real life later on and are still together now. If you want some juicy gossip, Triple H was originally dating China in real life, then left her for Stephanie. Gasp! The story's been told a million times, you can find it somewhere. Stephanie was brilliant at what she did, and over the years has played a fantastic role within the company, not only on screen, but backstage. She plays this brilliant heel and has had some really great matches, including a pretty unexpectedly fantastic match against Trish at the pay-per-view No Way Out in February 01. I honestly wonder sometimes if Vince never had a daughter, would WWE be as progressive as it is now? Much of the recent changes were ushered in by a behind-the-scenes Stephanie McMahon. Back then, 
Steph was in a unique position, being the boss's daughter, that she was able to have some sway even during a period where sometimes the writers didn't even speak directly to the female talent backstage and instead used a middleman of who they were valeting for at the time to tell them what their storyline and segments were to be that week. Stephanie, alongside Lita, were the first two women to ever main event Raw on August 21st, 2000. And what a brilliant segue that is to talk about my goat and the woman that I can say truly inspired a young, weird me who didn't fit in with girls my age to be unapologetically me and someone who many of the women wrestlers today cite as one of their inspirations, Lita. Lita came from a different background to most of the women on the roster at the time. She was a trained wrestler and had experience wrestling around the world in Lucha Libre scenes. And yet, she started back in America as a valet as well. A stunning figure with her bright red hair and edgier vibe than the other divas, Lita always said that she felt like, quote, the underdog that nobody believed in. She said in a 2023 interview with PW Mania that she, quote, just wandered her way into the WWE ring. I don't feel like I was supposed to catch on, and I know that it was the fans that made that happen. I was just going to be a random person who knew how to take bumps to support other people, and then I became so much more than that. After some time of appearing on ECW as a valet, she finally met Matt and Jeff Hardy, who took her under their wing and trained with her, helping her get a foot in the door in joining the WWF. It didn't take long for her to be paired with them as management saw that their real life friendships would translate incredibly well on screen and soon they were dubbed Team Extreme. And damn, did Team Extreme embody the alternative style at the time perfectly. And in addition to their high-flying daredevil style, this trio became huge fan favorites. Not only was Lita garnering the attention of the male fans, but she was becoming hugely popular among young women who for the first time saw a female wrestler on their screen who felt relatable and like someone you could be friends with. Now it wasn't just the young men watching, it was their girlfriends or sisters too. Similar to China, it's safe to say that if you had a few of the men in your corner speaking up for you and helping push you both in ring and backstage, you had the opportunity to get ahead and finally prove yourself to management. Lita was getting all sorts of screen time, being involved in many six-person intergender tag matches during a time that tag team wrestling was just starting to change the game thanks to the Hardys, Edge and Christian and the Dudley boys, as well as being a part of the aforementioned first ever women's match to main event Raw against Stephanie McMahon, winning the women's championship. Lita was being brought into huge spots amongst the men, interfering in matches to help her teammates, taking bumps from the male wrestlers, including being beaten with a steel chair, and even being allowed to successfully pin some of the men. Lita had become so popular in this time that during shows that had the likes of Stone Cold or The Rock and Ring, she would receive some of the biggest pops from the crowd when her music would hit. As YouTube channel Wrestle With Annie said, clearly she was connecting with people in a way that just couldn't be taught. This isn't to say though that she was immune to the woman treatment. Still having to partake in several bikini contests and bar and panties matches over this time against newcomers Stacey Keebler and Tori Wilson which, well, was just a much more aptly named evening gown match, just without the evening gowns. And I can't believe I've been sitting here talking about Lita all this time without mentioning her all-time greatest rival, friend, tag team partner, and duo in changing the game for women's wrestling, Trish Stratus. Initially written off as being another piece of eye candy, Trish came into the company as a fitness model without any wrestling experience. Pegged initially as a heel valet, Trish excelled in her position, but she wanted more. She was fantastic on the mic and happily took this brilliant powerbomb through a table by Bubba Ray Dudley after weeks of antagonizing him, and it only went up from there. Trish made her in-ring debut and was pulled into the six-person tag matches that Lita was in, and after the clear showing the chemistry the two had between them, they would start their own one-on-one -on -one feud. Now this was history in the making. And the best part is that behind the scenes, these two were absolute best friends. They knew exactly what the place of a woman was in the industry, but they both knew that they had something gold and spent every single week building each other and the women's division up beyond anything it had been before. As Trisha's popularity rose, so did her in-ring abilities, but of course, she was written into an on-screen storyline where she was the mistress of Vince McMahon, being shown in numerous raunchy promos with the company's CEO, who, by the way, had ultimate say in the show's narratives. 
We love a king who writes self-insert fan fiction that he gets to star in each week with the beautiful women under his employ, where if they don't participate, their very livelihood is on the line. But... This got Trish into storylines with Stephanie McMahon, giving her more airtime and opportunities to wrestle another woman who was being given proper opportunities and matches. You gotta do what you gotta do, right? She had that great match I mentioned with Steph at No Way Out, but then found herself in an extremely humiliating segment where Vince McMahon forced her to degrade herself in the ring on all fours and bark like a dog. Considering what we've heard recently from the ongoing lawsuit, is anyone surprised? It was hard going. Talents like Lita and Trish and Molly Holly weren't always being fostered and they were still getting placed in matches that were made to show off their bodies or degrade them. It was a women's division that was still mostly made up of models and non-wrestlers, so even though they were having special spots amongst the men or each other here and there, they would be forced back into these matches where there wasn't much wrestling, rather just stripping each other naked and pulling each other's hair or just slapping each other across the face. I'm aware I'm repeating myself, but like, this is really how it was, and I feel like I really need to hammer in the fact that it was pretty fucked for a while. But that didn't stop them. They would partake in these matches because they knew and hoped that by doing this, they could establish themselves as good and reliable talent who can help the industry grow in the long run. And look, this was a different time. It's not surprising that the industry was misogynistic. It was filled with roid-filled tough guys who hazed people backstage, cheated on their partners with divas and fans alike, and were hugely racist and homophobic. To be honest, I actually can't believe how far the industry has come. As someone who works in esports and gaming, a newer male-dominated industry, we are nowhere even close to the current level of equality that you see in professional wrestling today. This is one of those eras that I think that people look at with rose-colored glasses. It was really good. Wrestling was really fun here, and I remember how fun all of this era was, but... It was good, it was the first time wrestling was really hitting the mainstream and there was a part that women had to play and back then when wrestling wasn't this established industry like it is, one of the things that would pull people in was naked women. So look, I get it, I get it, I'm not here to criticize, well I kind of am. Ruh row we just lost a lawsuit initiated by the World Wildlife Fund over the WWF trademark and have now rebranded to the now household name of WWE World Wrestling Entertainment. This paved the way for a new era, known as the Ruthless Aggression Era, aptly advertised with the slogan, Get the F out. Gotta say... I love some crass innuendo. The Ruthless Aggression Era and the previous Attitude Era are the two most beloved and popular times in WWE history, even though many of its storylines and gimmicks have aged terribly. Nostalgia is always seen through rose-colored glasses. The Ruthless Aggression Era was when I first really started watching wrestling, coming home from school and watching Raw and SmackDown on Foxtel with my dad and brother, so I gotta say it really holds a special place in my heart. The theme songs, the Titantron designs, the wrestlers of the era, the amount of nostalgia I get watching anything from this time sometimes makes me emotional. I just wanna be, wanna be love. While the Attitude Era had record-breaking ratings with louder crowds and an air of unpredictability as you'd never know where they'd push the lines or pivot their stories to each week, the Ruthless Aggression Era ushered in what many would consider a much more grounded product overall. The roster became much larger and more diverse, the matches got dramatically better, and the focus on storytelling grew tenfold. The Attitude Era walked so the Ruthless Aggression Era could run. This was a time where we saw names like Randy Orton, Mickey James, Rey Mysterio, Kurt Angle, Beth Phoenix, Natalia, Eddie Guerrero, Chris Benoit, Michelle McCool, Melina, Rob Van Dam, Booker T, Gail Kim, Batista, Kelly Kelly, Jazz, and John Cena joining the roster. Pretty big names. And now, it's going to be hard to not keep talking about Trish Stratus throughout all of the Ruthless Aggression era, because seriously... I don't care if you're Britney frickin' Spears. This was the era of Stratisfaction. By now, she was beyond any fitness model. She was the goddamn burning fire and the full package. A brilliant wrestler, absolutely incredible on the mic. Seriously, watch any of her promos ever, heal her face, it's magnificent. As well as stunting in the blonde-haired sexy body that the WWE was so rigid on, a comment on her YouTube video of her theme song says it plainly, that opening giggle is as iconic as shattering glass. 
I mean, that song Time to Rock and Roll was performed by Lil' Kim before she blew up. Icons repping icons. Even though growing up, I leant more towards Lita, she was the one I could relate to, it's not an over-exaggeration to say that Trish has been one of the best to ever do it. And it was in the Ruthless Aggression era that she did it. But even with the progression of the industry in this era, the diva division was still lacking in the fact that they were often not given much screen time, which would cause tension backstage between the women, and many were still being put into these sexy gimmick matches, despite their wrestling talents. Several divas have since said that there were times that they would be put into a food fight or a lingerie match as punishments because management weren't happy with them for, I don't know, having an opinion? And holy shit, I cannot believe some of the storylines they ran over this time. Who remembers HLA, hot lesbian action, where two random women came to the ring, undressed each other, pretended to kiss while being egged on by Raw General Manager Eric Bischoff, and proceeded to get ruthlessly beat up by two men? What about the storyline where Lita gets forced to marry Kane, is suddenly pregnant somehow after all you've seen her is say no, then Snitsky causes her to have a miscarriage, and then he comes out later on with a fake baby that he proceeds to punt into the stands. What about the literal implied rape scene of Michael Cole, straight from the mind of none other than Vince McMahon himself? I'm surprised he didn't self-insert into this storyline considering his obsession with big muscly men. Hey Vince. Who can forget the parking lot brawl where Sable's bra was ripped off and her breasts were shown on live TV? Or just the constant pressure to have the women kiss each other? Um, what the hell, WWE? That's queer baiting. Oh, don't worry. They're aware. There's nothing wrong with a little kiss. I mean, we got to see Brock Lesnar boo plan a big old smooch on Kurt Angle, but like, come on, fellas, pack it up, get your hands out of your pants. But despite all of this, things were changing slowly. The divas of this era were great, and with a little more focus being put on training them up to be competent both in ring and on the mic, we did get to see some killer matches sprinkled in between the gimmick ones. They were laying the groundwork for today. Real quick though, let me just list a couple of these gimmick matches for you though, just to set the scene before I dive into all the positives in the Trailblazers. The Bikini Contest, where the divas would get undressed into a bikini and the one with the most cheers would win. Same goes for a lingerie match. The first one ever between Tori Wilson and Stacey Keebler was placed in WWE's Top 10 Matches of 2001. Wow, congrats girlies. A fulfill your fantasy match where fans could vote online to decide on the outfits worn by the divas. Anything from a schoolgirl outfit to a nurse to leather and lace. Mud matches. Mmm, self explanatory. Sometimes it would be pudding or eggnog or gravy instead. Wet and wild matches. Again, self explanatory. They wore white. Pillow fights, evening gown matches, bra and panties matches. Mmm, there were more. But that's enough. And I reiterate get your hands out of your pants. This is the kind of stuff that eight-year-old me was watching. I remember playing bra and panties matches on SmackDown vs. Raw 2007 with my brother on our PS2. And this happened all throughout the Attitude and Ruthless Aggression eras. I want to add, I don't think there's anything wrong with women being sexy on camera. I believe it can be fun and empowering if you want it to be. My issue is that many of the divas were forced into these matches, again, sometimes as punishments. With Gail Kim saying that these matches, quote, were some of the most traumatic moments of my life that I have to live with, feeling like I never had a choice. If you say no, you might lose your job at the literal top of the industry. And with that, real quick, it's time to stand Fit Finley. After a history of competing across WCW and WWE, Fit Finley retired from wrestling to take up a training and coaching position and over time has become one of the many unsung heroes of the women's evolution. Fit Finley would be the one to produce the women's matches during this time and loudly supported them and advocated for them. When the women were put into the sexy gimmick matches, Fit would come to them and say respectfully, look, this is what we're doing tonight. It's not what I would pick, but at the end of the day, you guys are entertainers and we're going to entertain the fans and do this in the classiest way possible. He's not the only one to back the women like this. There's people like TJ Wilson, who in more recent times has done great stuff, Arn Anderson, but he is absolutely mentioned the most by a lot of women wrestlers past and present. And so that man deserves his flowers. All right, let's get into some of the positives of the era. Firstly, Lillian Garcia. 
the first woman to ever announce at a WrestleMania, Lillian's legendary voice accompanied some of the biggest moments in WWE for two decades. Absolutely iconic. Now, the Ruthless Aggression era had what I would consider, and some people online also, to be three great feuds for the women's division. Great feud of the era, number one, is of course, Trish and Lita. Yes, okay, we're talking about Trish and Lita again already, but I cannot understate the absolute influence they had on the industry. I'll get through this one as quick as possible, but not because it's any less valuable than the others, only because I'm trying to not let this video get out of hand. I've already spoken about them quite a bit. Trish and Lita's rivalry was the first of its kind. Both of them traded roles over the time, heel to face, face to heel, and they thrived in both. You have Trish, the fitness model turned wrestler with her blonde hair and classic WWE diva look. Then there was Lita, fiery red hair, tattoos, the G-strings. She had this edge that no other diva could emulate. They were this beautiful antithesis to each other, two sides of the same coin, and their evenly matched skills with their polar opposite looks made it so easy for fans to pick a side just from one look. I was a Lita fan, my brother was a Trish fan. Arguably one of, if not the most iconic Trish and Lita matches was in June 2004 on Raw. They were the main event for the night and the women's title was on the line. And what a fucking match. Such a brilliant match that according to commentator Jim Ross, male wrestlers backstage were absolutely furious that the women were not only given that spot, but that they dared to do such an incredible job. Not only the wrestling itself, but the storytelling. This was the match with that infamous suicide dive from Lita where she completely scorpions and it looks as if she's broken her neck, where keep in mind, she'd only returned recently from a prior broken neck injury while filming for a TV show. Add this match to your homework for after this video, okay? Because this was a masterclass for women's wrestling. Okay, I kept it short. If you want more Lita and Trish, there's content of it everywhere on the internet. So go look at that later. Now, let's pivot back to WWE's direction at the time to pad the Divas division with models who they hoped to turn into wrestlers. Throughout the Ruthless Aggression era, they ran a competition called the WWE Diva Search. The Diva Search was a fan-voted tournament where WWE invited women aged 18 or above who believed they possessed the quote, beauty, strength, and intelligence required to be the next WWE Diva to apply. Applicants were asked to submit a photo of themselves along with a brief written explanation of their aspirations to become a WWE Diva. The Diva Search ran yearly throughout most of the Ruthless Aggression era, where each year's winners would then join the roster of Divas as well as some of the runner-ups. This competition is how WWE found Christy Hemi, Ashley Massaro, Candice Michelle, Layla, Eve Torres, Eva Marie, Michelle McCool, Maria Canellis, Maurice, and even the Bella Twins. Now, to no discredit to any of the women I just mentioned, but it was frustrating to see WWE going down this path of wanting to find good-looking women rather than good wrestlers. Many of these divas absolutely went on to become great wrestlers. Just take a look at the history of the Bella Twins or Layla and Michelle McCool of Christy Hemi and the work she went on to do in TNA. But we had Melina, who spent years training to be a professional wrestler before she found her way to WWE. Melina, who was called one of the best wrestlers in the world by Bret Hart. We had Victoria, a bodybuilder and fitness competitor who was encouraged by China to become a wrestler. They were both beautiful, stunning, and incredible wrestlers. But obviously this was a time where WWE, or should I say Vince, wanted the classic blonde model beauty. Who cares if they can't wrestle? We don't give the women proper matches anyway. What we really need on this wrestling show is women who will be willing to get almost naked and won't give lip about it because they have experience modeling and being almost naked already. Run along now. But, but every now and then there were great matches. There was growth despite. How couldn't there have been when Trish was literally the blueprint existing in the same ring as them? And that leads me to the second great feud of the era, Trish Stratus, once again, and Victoria. This was a ravenous feud, aggressive, unhinged. These two were battling constantly, with Victoria really taking things to another level, hitting Trish over the head with a steel chair, throwing her into the steel steps, doing things to each other that women had never been seen doing in a WWE ring before. Over this entire feud, these two women truly beat the shit out of each other. It was incredible to see. Victoria had this air about her, and not to mention those muscles, you just believe she'd be unhinged enough to beat someone up as ruthlessly as she beat up Trish. It was iconic. 
And Trish does such an excellent job at being beat up, something she's mentioned she enjoys. At the 2002 Survivor Series pay-per-view, they had a hardcore match. And God, it was a good one. Using weapons and this crazed aggressive style from Victoria not seen before, this match deserves its place in history. So add it to your list. As written by Anthony Davies on thesignaturespot.com, quote, This match at Survivor Series was heavily talked about as a moment in which women's wrestling took a new step toward equality, but their whole feud is that step, not just that match. Their hardcore match on pay-per-view is just a snapshot of the hard-hitting feud that they played out. Victoria herself has said in reflection on their feud, quote, Trish and I, we had a rule, we'll say sorry later, we're going to kick each other's ass now. All they wanted to do was push the boundaries of what a WWE diva was, and they were doing it together every week. They understood how important the work they were doing was, and they were happy to put their bodies on the line for it. This feud did such a good job at putting both women over in their respective roles. Trish was already the beloved babyface, and it hurt to see your fave girly having her head catapulted into a steel trash can. It made you absolutely loathe the terrifying heel of Victoria, and in turn it builds up her reputation. She was strong and terrifying, and at this point, if Victoria was given some China treatment in putting her face to face with the men, you would believe it immediately. Victoria was so over during this time that she debuted a new theme song, Worldwide Hit All the Things She Said by Tattoo. To be given the rights to a hugely popular song like this outside of the wrestling world is an honor. I think that talking about Victoria is a good chance to speak about the culture in the WWE locker rooms as this is something she's spoken on publicly. There was always hazing and bullying. There were always cliques for both the men and the women. It was an extremely competitive environment that was only encouraged by the culture where, despite being signed full-time to WWE, wrestlers are still considered independent contractors. You have to get your own rental cars, your own hotels, with your own money. There are numerous stories of people's possessions and bags being messed with. You weren't allowed to be in the locker room unless you were contracted. And even then, many times newer wrestlers would have to get dressed and prepared for the show in the stadium bathrooms or hallways or janitor closets. Oftentimes, if you were one of the new girls, especially one of the model rookies, you were targeted. Victoria was one of the seasoned women who were great with the newbies, especially Christy Hemi and Candice Michelle. She took them on the road with her, would practice with them and train them and willingly put them over just to wrestle and help the division. So shout out to Victoria, who deserves to be in the Hall of Fame already. The Widow's Peak is one of my favorite finishes ever. It just looked so fucking good. I hope one day she gives it to someone on the current roster because I'd love to see it regularly again. Peyton Royce has since done it, but I'd love to see one of the more built women try to perform it. Maybe Jade Cargill? That'd be cool. Okay, Great Feud of the Era number three. One of the most beloved feuds of all time, regardless of gender, with one of the best WrestleMania builds ever. A true shining moment of proper long-term storytelling in the WWE. Trish Stratus and Mickie James a certified future Hall of Famer and someone labeled as a worker, not a spot doer by leader, Mickie James joined WWE after a brilliant run in the indies and TNA. She came in with such a dynamic and unique gimmick, an obsessive die-hard fan of Trish Stratus. Just like the rest of us, Mickie was truly infected with stage four Stratisfaction. I'm sorry to tell you, there is no cure. Over months, we saw this storyline slowly progress, turning a relatively unknown talent into an icon of the division, with fans tuning in week after week to boo the psychotic heel that was Mickey as she wouldn't leave their favorite star alone, and probably also because they were jealous as hell. From a beginning that saw Trish befriending this super fan turned superstar, where Mickey was getting involved in Trish's matches to save her, accompanying her to the ring, and even eliminating herself in a battle royale to ensure Trish's victory, to the slow realization from Trish that maybe this was more obsession than fanship with Mickey kissing Trish under a mistletoe, dedicating a shrine to her, and dressing up as her for Halloween. Slowly but surely, Trish tried to distance herself from Mickey, and as Mickey felt rejected, her devotion turned into aggression, culminating in hands down one of the best women's matches of the decade. After eight months of build-up, genuine long-term storytelling that you rarely saw given to the women, something incredible happened during their 2006 WrestleMania match 
which is now on our list. We watched as the crowd of over 17,000 fans turned on all-time beloved baby face of the division Trish freaking Stratus and cheer for the heel Mickey James. Moments like these are why I love wrestling. At the end of the day, no matter what the creative team writes, they're never going to 100% know how the fans will react, especially when Vince was in charge. And after all this time watching Mickey prove herself and fight for Trish only to be rejected by her as well as be one of the most dynamic performers you saw in the ring each week, the fans turned on Trish. They wanted Mickey to win. She deserved it, even though Trish had every right to try to put distance between her and what was practically a stalker. Moments like these are electric and real. They're not scripted. No one could have guessed the crowd would turn like that. This reaction came out of the passion and love that these two performers put in for the better half of a decade and, in my opinion, was undeniable proof that devoting creative energy to the women's division was needed and wanted. According to Trish, when they both walked backstage that night after their match, they were met with a standing ovation from production and the locker room. Fucking deserved. And pretty incredible to hear as well, considering all the stories we know of women having great matches and walking backstage to trouble. Now, for those of you who weren't watching WWE at this time, I'm about to tell you a tale of misogyny, mistreatment, and how impossibly difficult it can be to be a WWE superstar sometimes. And you'll be shocked to learn that it's about Lita. Yes, Lita, who completely changed the game for women in the industry. Yes, Lita, who almost every single woman wrestler today cites as an influence. Yes, Lita, who made some mistakes in her personal life which were wrenched out into a WWE storyline for all the world to see. I haven't mentioned this yet because I don't exactly think it's pertinent to Lita's story until now, but Lita was dating fellow Team Extreme member Matt Hardy for the better half of a decade in real life. To keep a long story short, at some point things got complicated and as far as the story goes, Lita cheated on Matt with fellow wrestler Edge while Matt was out with an injury. And when Matt found out about the affair, he made it public and aired it all out on the internet. Now. If you want the whole story, there's going to be like 20 video essays and at least like 100 more articles all over the internet about this. So go have Google if you want more info, if you want like the whole tea of it all. But this was an insane time for Leader and Edge, with their personal lives being dragged into their professional. WWE crowds were disgusted with them and would shout insults and boos at them anytime they were on screen. Things like, we want Matt and you screwed Matt were chanted at Edge, whereas Lita received much worse and had the most abhorrent things said to her by the audience who by now had completely turned on her. You can imagine the kind of misogynistic stuff they were saying. This was the early 2000s. And so WWE turned real life into a storyline. I suppose they had to, right? Like two of their hugest stars were now receiving real genuine heat from the fans. So WWE turned their real life relationship into an on-screen duo where they turned into Raw's hottest heels at the time the rated R couple. They amped up their sexuality. They lent into the fiery heat they were receiving. They would get as crass as they possibly could. Lita herself said on the Broken Skull Sessions podcast with Stone Cold that her and Edge would try to gross each other out with how far they'd take it sometimes. They were total professionals and morphed their on-screen characters into the disgusting sexual deviants that the WWE universe were believing them to be. And eventually, of course, there was a storyline involving the three of them. It was gross and messy and ended up embarrassing Matt even more, in my opinion, but alas. This real-life feud turned storyline brought in huge ratings and catapulted Edge into the star he is today, while Slita was the one left to bear the brunt of hatred from the fans. She is the home-wrecking whore, of course. Never mind the fact that Edge was married at the time himself. Poor Lita was subject to months of abuse from the fans who had completely turned on her and at the end of 2006, after all of this abuse and without the emotional support of her bestie Trish after her retirement two months earlier, Lita sadly retired from the WWE while she was in her prime. Real quick, add Trish's retirement match against Lita at Unforgiven 2006 to your watch list. Go on. But not before one of the most infamous segments in all of WWE could happen. The live sex celebration. A thrilling main event segment where Lena and Edge, with a satin covered bed situated in the middle of the ring, celebrated Edge's first world title win by having kayfabe sex in that very bed on live television. 
Sexy music was playing. The two were undressing. Lita was on the bed in doggy, having her hair pulled before they get under the covers. There was a bit of rustling, then Edge pokes his heads out with Lita's panties in his mouth. I watched this with my dad. <laughs> and of course, because it's wrestling, baby, it gets interrupted. First by Ric Flair, who implied he was about to hop into bed with Lita to show Edge how it's done. Fortunately, out comes Cena to save the day after Edge himself had run off, leaving Lita alone in the bed in the middle of the ring, naked. After some teasing to the crowd, Cena ripped the blankets off with Lita now in Edge's clothes and hit Lita with his finisher. Man, man, none of them wanted to do this segment, but Vince insisted. Lita was even told that if she didn't go through with it, she'd be fired. And so she did, as a total professional, even while she was being torn apart by the same WWE fans who had been cheering her on for so long previously. And you know what? That episode of Raw pulled the highest ratings that they had had in well over a year. So congrats to Vince or whatever. All you had to do was destroy one of your most iconic women wrestlers' reputation and mental health to do it. I hate to leave this era off on such a negative note, but this was the reality of being a woman in wrestling. Sex appeal, blood, swearing, controversy. Long ago, the four pillars of WWE lived together in harmony, but everything changed when the PG programming attacked. It's July 2008, and WWE announces that they will be turning into a PG product in an attempt to become more family friendly and gain access to the younger fan base that weren't watching due to those aforementioned pillars. This was a total revamp of the product, fundamentally changing so many aspects of the weekly shows in what seemed to be a reaction to public backlash from the mature content. Many also speculate the whole Chris Benoit of it all prompted some of this change but we'll never know. This era has been titled by many as the dark era of women's wrestling. And I don't fully disagree. And my agreement doesn't mean I think the women at the time were trash. It just became rough. And the dedication to their growth and storylines was practically completely halted. Trish had left, so had Lita. There were women left on the roster who knew how to wrestle, but a gaping hole had been left by the top performers of the time and thereby the women who had the most sway backstage with the writers, with upper management. A lot of the time, the huge challenge was convincing management or the writers to get behind you and help push you. And with the want from management for the last decade for the divas to be sexy and picked up from other avenues than wrestling, there just wasn't a place for them in this PG era like there had been before. No more bra and panties matches, no more live sex celebrations. So they kept the eye candy, but oftentimes didn't know what to do with them. There, of course, were some shining moments throughout, as well as some total fucking blunders. But progression isn't always linear, and the actions of the divas during this time were still paving the way for the excellence of the future to come. Let's quickly talk a little bit about this era in general, just set the scene a bit. NXT was launched, WWE's developmental program, although in a very different structure to what we see now. We saw the infamous CM Punk pipe bomb, and you couldn't go anywhere without seeing John Cena's face on it. Cena was the face of the company over the PG era in the way that Roman Reigns is now. Not face as in the good guy, although he was always booked as a baby face. Face as in his literal face represented the company. So I want to start this era off by once again talking about Mickey James and basically what the end of her run at WWE looked like because it echoes the path to leaders in the way that a once highly respected woman in the company gets taken down a peg by management because... I don't know, you can fill in the blanks. Sexism. In an interview with Billy Corgan, Mickey brings up the issue of the creative writers in WWE being men, and that, of course, issues will then always arise when men, without the lived experience of being a woman, are trying to write storylines for them. Mickey says that she, quote, would argue with whoever my writer is, and because he's not a female, he couldn't understand why I was saying, that doesn't really work, it doesn't make sense, I would never really say it like that because that's not how women think. It's like when you read a male author writing about a female lead, constantly mentioning how she's aware of the way her breasts are sitting and everything she says is littered with the internal fire of her sexuality. 
The girls will know what I'm talking about. This just isn't how women think. Men aren't saying things in casual conversation with the inflection of the way their dick is sitting. Our bodies are just simply existing. Although we get written as though everything we say is laden with the bounce of a pair of anime titties with no real physics. I'm getting off topic, but you know what I mean, right? Mickey notes that there were often feelings that the writers wouldn't listen to the ideas women would pitch because they implied they were just doing it to get themselves over or to get attention rather than for the company. To me, this just screams as a weak excuse to not have to listen to the girls and write proper storylines for them because internal management didn't see them as worth it. Because isn't everyone trying to get themselves over? Provided the idea is good, who cares if they're doing it for themselves or for the locker room, right? Because it's good for the company. This would never be an issue for the men pitching a storyline that they're involved in, considering we have proof of the known biases there have been backstage over the years for people like Shawn Michaels and Triple H in The Click. And this leads into a lovely storyline that Mickey was written into that she rightly thinks was an attempt to humble her by management, to devalue her and get the fans to start to laugh at her, to bury her. The good old Piggy James storyline. Michelle McCool was the women's champion at this time and one of the most over women in the company, as well as being a part of notorious heel duo Lay Cool, along with Layla. Now these two were a brilliant tag team and we'll get to the incredible work they did together soon. But this storyline was a rough time for the division. Already the divas don't get a lot of screen time, but suddenly, this storyline was being given long segments where the main joke was that Mickey was fat. Mickey James, one of the best women's wrestlers of all time, a gorgeous woman, and as she says, no bigger than 63 kilos or 140 pounds at that time, like that part even matters. It was an extremely distasteful storyline where they were literally bullying this woman for her body and weight at the same time that the WWE were running a huge anti-bullying campaign. Don't worry, they received a lot of rightful criticism. There was a segment where Layla would come out in a fat suit with a pig nose to Mickey's music, then chase Michelle around who had a donut in her hand. A segment where right after defeating Layla, a video would play of Michelle singing Old MacDonald had a farm with Mickey's face edited on a pig as she stood in the ring crying. Looks like it's feeding time, Piggy James, was said by Michelle as Mickey was held in a headlock with cake shoved into her face and punch poured all over her. This went on for a long time. Of course, following backlash, critiques, not the pay-per-view, WWE felt like they had to make it right. They couldn't end this storyline with Mickey losing. That's not very good TV or very inspirational for the now kid audience watching this PG product at home. So she won the championship from Layla in the end. Hooray, we beat the bullies despite everything. But WWE had no desire to give Mickey a long reign. Their ultimate goal was to humiliate her and they'd effectively done it. So she lost the title back to McCool within the month and left the company soon after. What a send off, WWE. Way to treat your top female talent with respect and dignity. And I feel the need to explain, none of the girls wanted to do these segments. Michelle would apologize to Mickey before segments would start because she knew how horrible they were, but they had to do what they had to do at the company. And there were some positives that came from this storyline. Some fans have expressed directly to Mickey that they really enjoyed the storyline and at times in their lives when they were feeling insecure or they were being bullied, it helped them get through it and felt seen. It also put Michelle and Layla over as this monster heel duo, absolutely ruthless, bitchy, and mean heels. Granted, they used this easy, cheap heat of two mean girls bullying someone to do it, but it worked. Already, as I said, Michelle was one of the most over women in the company. Despite being someone who was picked up from the diva searches, Michelle had put in hard fucking work to become a good wrestler and it was paying off for her. She had this hard hitting, very stiff style of working along with incredible heel character work, which made her feel extremely dominant. I feel like from the moment you saw her, you understood her character. Plus, I love anyone who can hit a good stiff boot to the head. Mm. There was a match at Night of Champions in 2009 where Michelle went up against Melina. And this match, despite being cut for time, of course, was fucking excellent. They did this awesome spot when during Melina's entrance where she does the splits on the apron, Michelle drop kicked her straight out of the ring before the match could even start. And these two girls, 
got backstage heat, basically got in trouble because they dared to have a really good match. Too good for girls, is what Michelle said. There was another match between Michelle and Victoria this time where they were told they had to go back out and redo the entire match in front of the same audience because they were told their punches and kicks looked too good. This literally led to a ban of any punches and kicks in women's matches for a good while. What the fuck? Now, back to Lay Cool. To me, underrated when conversations of best women wrestlers happen. Potentially because a lot of their storylines haven't aged well and again, you know, a dark era for women. Also, Beth Phoenix was there amongst everything being the badass she was at the time, so you know, I think they just get overlooked a bit. The main thing Lay Cool would be remembered for, aside from all that, is their co-reign of the Women's Championship. This begun after Layla and Michelle would go up against Beth Phoenix in a two-on-one handicap match with Layla picking up the pin and decided that they were both champs because they both won the match. It was a 2v1. Eventually, they were told by Teddy Long to decide who was the actual champion, which led to them splitting the championship into a BFFL title where they had one half each. Blah, 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 infighting and jealousy. But this storyline would lead to what would finally retire the women's championship for years. Two years earlier, in 2008, the Divas Championship had been introduced. This was an attempt to have a woman as champion on each brand. Raw and SmackDown, as from 2002 to 2008, SmackDown was without a women's championship. Michelle was actually the inaugural Divas Champion prior to all this late cool stuff, followed by a dominating reign of 211 days by Maurice, who was an icon in her own right. And so for two years, there were these two belts in rotation in the women's division. It almost felt like things were progressing. Unfortunately, no. This felt like a two steps forward, ten steps back scenario, as in 2010, Lake Hall unified the belts and the women's championship was no more. The Divas title. This little fella boasting a delicate butterfly gemstone in pink, the only remaining representation of what it was to be a WWE diva. Everyone has their opinion on this belt. Some people love it and think it's absolutely iconic, that it's great to see something feminine and fun like that on a WWE product, especially after the aggression and sexualization of the previous eras, that it brings to mind all the incredible stars who held this title over the years, that these women were doing great things despite the rampant sexism. From an objective standpoint, I don't think this belt is inherently bad. It started off as a variation to the standard gold belt of the Women's Championship. It's cute as hell. And it's not too different from other women's titles out there. Just take a look at some of the titles of Japanese wrestling promotion stardom. They're so cute and something so many women would be proud to wear, likely because of their bright colors and cute design. But I do believe the butterfly belt at that time in WWE history was in bad taste and was a plain representation of the way WWE saw their divas division. As soft widow butterflies with a focus on the hyper feminine, it's basically the act of patting a woman on the head and saying, good job on looking pretty tonight while they're sweating and in pain after a killer match despite it being cut short for time because one of the men's matches went over in the form of a belt. Why did it have to be pink? Why did it have to be a butterfly? It implies this weakness and softness, and it's just rampant with stereotypes. I think Sasha Banks' opinion on the butterfly belt is the one that I align myself the most with. During her interview on the Broken Skull sessions when speaking on the belt, she said to Stone Cold, would you wear it? Would Roman Reigns? Would John Cena? No, they fucking wouldn't. And there's the inequality. These women were full-time, busy, and capable wrestlers putting their bodies, time, energy, and personal lives on the line for this company, just like the men were. Why did their success need a pink sticker slapped over the top? To me, it was just infantilizing and spoke to the glass ceilings that were actively being like rebuilt after their previous shattering by the likes of people like Trish just years earlier. I mean, <laughs> One of the most glaring examples that shows that internal WWE really didn't give a single fuck about their women's division at the time was when Santino Morella, dressed as his sister Santina, entered into the Divas Battle Royale at WrestleMania 25 and won. And no disrespect to Santino, he was always a favorite of mine to watch and his work with Beth Phoenix was so much fun. But 
when you have a single match on a card dedicated to the women and then a woman doesn't even win at WrestleMania? It's just embarrassing and disrespectful. If the WWE doesn't care about the Divas division, then why should we? But, as I'm saying time and time again, good things were happening. Mainly, Beth Phoenix and Natalia. Oh man, these girls were a saving grace for the division at this time, where there just wasn't much competition outside of Lay Cool. Funnily enough, they were breaking the mold, but were still getting pushes from management. They both had the blonde hair, yes, and they were gorgeous, but they were strong. They had muscles and they fought fucking hard. Let's start with Beth, the Glamazon. Beth felt like the China of her generation and has said herself that she wanted to be halfway between China and Trish. And she was, following in both their footsteps of being the first woman to compete in matches held only for the men up until that point. In 2010, Beth Phoenix was the second woman to ever enter a Royal Rumble, eliminating the great Carly. Now that is putting someone over. In another comparison to China, Beth was placed in this hilarious duo with Santino Morella, which echoed the pairing that we saw between China and Eddie Guerrero in the 90s. She was involved in the first ever women I quit match with Melina, which add that to your watch list, no PG era match has come close to equaling it. This was awesome because it was very out of the box. They were both heels and they were outside of the championship storyline and were still given a spot after some awesome backstage brawls that really showed off their chemistry. Lightning in a bottle, Beth describes it as. Beth and Natalia were involved in the first ever women's table match at TLC, where to win, you have to throw someone through a table against Lay Cool. That double sharpshooter from Natalia was fucking rad, and the tense moment when the table didn't break properly when Lay Cool were both thrown into it, add that to your list, girlies. And goddamn, I can't not mention Survivor Series 2011, Beth vs. Eve Torres. Beth had this awesome finish of the Glam Slam. It looked like it hurt, and you know, it probably did a little. And in this match, Beth did it from the top rope. A huge move for two women to execute at this time. And this is something that they were both told ahead of the match that they weren't allowed to do. This happened often from management. We already know they didn't like when the women would upstage the men with great matches or spots, but they would also be very just like restrictive on the bumps they were allowed to take. Little butterflies, I remind you. But they both knew it would be a huge moment. They were at Madison Square Garden. They took a risk and it paid off. Beth would then continue to dominate the Divas division throughout the ebbs and flows of her career, and when she was finally paired with Natalia, it was just a match made in heaven. The Divas of Doom. Although technically a heel tag team, the fans loved them. All the things they were saying was true. They were fighting for the women's division to be better, to be less stereotypical. Quote, we're wrestlers, let us wrestle, says Beth. These two were selfless and put their talent, their abilities, and likely some of their sway backstage into improving the division for everyone. Natalia, a thankless legend in her own right, comes from the iconic Hart family. Her dad was Jim the Anvil Neidhart and her uncles Brett and Owen Hart. Wrestling's in her blood and you've seen that consistently over the last two decades as she is still an active wrestler in the WWE, the longest signed woman ever. Natalia had a number of amazing feuds and her feud with Caitlyn especially was a lot of fun. Watching her go from Caitlyn's mentor to her rival was great, and she was so good at putting over other women. Natty is a very giving performer. Even in losses, she makes herself look good while simultaneously making her opponent look strong. Natty is someone that so many women give credit with going above and beyond to help them out backstage, coming to the arenas early to practice, to teach them the basics. One person she helped mentor was Eve Torres, the 2007 Diva Search winner and three-time Divas champion with a combined reign of 258 days. She started off a little rough, as many of them did, but wow, her growth was palpable and she was intertwined in stories and matches with all the top women I've mentioned this era. I mean, seriously, the top rope glam slam she took from Beth? If you didn't add that to your list when I last mentioned it, do it now, okay? Right now, please. Thank you. Eve had such a cool moveset developed from a gymnast background and is praised by Caitlyn and the Bella Twins and even AJ Lee for helping them and inspiring them to push boundaries. There was this wild moment that Eve was involved in during a Divas Battle Royale on Raw where Eve and Caitlyn were the final two. Eve was supposed to win, 
but there was a botch and Eve accidentally falls from the rope and hits the floor, meaning Caitlyn had won. That is a crazy moment to watch, seeing the genuine shock on everyone's faces as the written storyline now has to be changed because there's no Tixies Baxies on live TV and Caitlyn is now the number one contender for the championship. Caitlyn was so terrified she'd be fired for the mistake, but she recounts now that Vince was laughing his ass off when they walked backstage, and in hindsight, Eve thinks it was better storytelling in the long run. They formed a close friendship through all their time competing together, and so for Eve's retirement match, she lost the title to Caitlyn and basically passed the torch to her at a time when Beth was also leaving and the division was changing so much. The PG era was a strange time for women in the WWE. At the start of the 2010s, places like TNA were doing much more for their women's division than WWE were. It's a shame that WWE held such a monopoly across wrestling that effectively these women would make it to the top of their industry, but then oftentimes be given nothing except injuries, trauma, and bad blood. I'm glad though that there were places like TNA that they could go to afterwards to excel and be given the time of day. One last fun little thing I thought I'd mention before we close out the era because, of course, this lovely lady needs a mention. On an episode of SmackDown in 2011, Kelly Kelly defended the World Heavyweight Championship for Edge after hitting a spear on Layla to end the match. Pretty cool. Also, a shout out to Alicia Fox for some firework in the 2010s. She's underappreciated, doesn't get mentioned enough. Okay, the era is over. Following on from the PG era, we arrive in the reality era. I will say, people argue that the PG era potentially finished earlier and thereby the reality era started earlier, but I'm going off when WWE themselves say the eras are, and for this video, where we're talking solely about women's wrestling, this is when I believe to be when the reality era started, at the launch of Total Divas. We'll get to that in a sec. In my opinion, there's not much difference between these eras. There was no sweeping change in the product itself like we've seen in the past with quite obvious cutoffs from era to era. Still, they had this huge roster of women, but no one was being given a compelling storyline. There was usually never more than one segment given to the women each show, and as I've mentioned, that was the first one to be cut for time if any others went over. But now, there was an opportunity to see some of the women of WWE on your screen more often. Hosted on E!, Total Divas was a reality series that followed the lives of a handful of the WWE Divas on the roster, both backstage and in their personal lives. This, to me, is really the first time we were easily having access to the wrestlers out of wrestling kayfabe. Nowadays, every wrestler has a social media presence and it's expected that you can find them all on Instagram and Twitter at the least. You get to see them posting about their personal lives, their families, friends, relationships. But Total Divas was sort of the first little taste of this and fit in with the climate of the time where shows like Keeping Up With The Kardashians and The Real Housewives were massively popular. And it helped bring in a new audience of women to WWE. Synonymous with the WWE brand from the time they debuted, the Bella Twins were a constant mainstay across our screens, as well as being almost basically the main two characters on Total Divas, to the point that they eventually got their own spin-off show, the Total Bellas. You saw their personal lives of Brie dating Daniel Bryan, Brian Danielson, and Nikki with John Cena at one point. You, you saw what their day-to-days looked like while they were holding or fighting for the Divas Championship and what it was like to be a WWE Diva and that busy schedule that accompanies all of it. It's not just the wrestling. There are appearances, signings. They are flying around America constantly. It blows my mind. I just love the Bella Twins. Their influence alone on the WWE brand during the time they were there and onwards was seriously immense. Starting from their twin magic days where they were two parts to one hole, switching out under the ring between matches to confuse the refs and win. And then on to when they started to wrestle individually and really grow into their own as solid wrestlers and storytellers, starting to actually look different. Nikki is hands down my favorite on Total Divas. That girl loves a glass of wine and so do I. The show did an interesting job of mixing reality television with WWE storylines in that we'd see the Bellas feud with their co-star Natalia when the show began as a way of cross-pollination. And that means, finally, 
I get to talk about AJ Lee, the longest reigning Divas champion of the time, up until Nikki dethroned her. She'd been in the WWE for a few years, involved in storylines with Caitlyn and the Divas of Doom, as well as seemingly constant romantic storylines with the likes of Daniel Bryan, CM Punk, John Cena, and Dolph Ziggler. Though I think these built up her character, this didn't feel like the usual eye candy make the man feel relevant and desired because he's kissing a hot woman romantic storylines WWE would write. AJ played this psycho, someone whose move you could never expect, whose emotions would jump from extreme to extreme, who would torment both the men she dated and the women she feuded with. I mean, she would literally skip to the ring. That girl played unhinged very fucking well. And then so finally, with this crazy outspoken character established and the Divas title over her shoulder, we saw her enter storylines with a total Divas cast. She'd antagonize them, make fun of them, and feud with them across a months long storyline that spanned across five pay-per-views. It was such a fun way to build up AJ's dominance whilst keeping the total Divas cast within the championship storyline and on people's screens for the new wave of viewers that WWE were having from the reality show. Her match with Caitlyn at Payback 2013 is another recommendation. The crowd was so invested, they'd had months and months and months of buildup and they refused to end the match even when the ref was telling them to go home, aka finish the match, because it was so damn good. I love the way AJ sells. The way she would absolutely fold in half when taking a spear from Caitlyn just made it look fucking deadly. While she was holding the championship and after she'd broken the record at that time for the longest reigning Divas champion, AJ got to defend and retain the title a few months later at WrestleMania 30 in a 14 woman match. This was the first time the Divas championship was ever defended at WrestleMania, wrestling's biggest show, six years after the title was introduced. And then the next night, in comes Paige. And if you've seen the movie Wrestling With My Family starring Florence Pugh, you'll know where this is going. 21-year-old Paige with her black hair and pale white skin, almost this awesome altered mirror image of AJ Lee, debuts on Raw and defeats AJ for the Divas Championship, making her the youngest Divas Champion in history, the first Diva to win the title in her debut match, and the only woman to hold both Divas and NXT Women's Championships at the same time. If you're ever in the mood to get a, just a little bit emotional watching someone accomplish just a lifelong dream of theirs, then you should watch this match, including the promo segment beforehand, and or just watch the movie. I love it. It's really good. February 23rd, 2015, Monday Night Raw. It's a tag team match. The Bella Twins versus Paige and Emma. Right before the girls were about to go out, Management comes to them and tells them they need to shorten their match to two minutes. Two minutes, including their entrances. The girls were fucking mad. So all they did was one finisher and then the pin and the match was over. They didn't even use up their remaining minute. They did not care. They were mad and wanted to stand up for themselves. Keep in mind, just two years prior, the Bellas were supposed to be in the only match on the card at WrestleMania 29 that had Divas involved, but right before it was to begin, they were told it was cut for time at WrestleFucking Mania. These girls were sick of it. And that night, Give Divas a Chance was born. For three days, hashtag Give Divas a Chance was trending. The fans were demanding that the women be treated better and not like a last thought. These were women these fans had been watching for years. They knew they were great wrestlers and fantastic storytellers. And with a growing diversity of the audience of WWE, people were so frustrated to not see that reflected across the product. Mick Foley and other names in the industry joined in on the support. Paige posted on Instagram with the hashtag. AJ Lee was straight up atting Stephanie McMahon on Twitter, pointing out the fact that the women's division has record selling merchandise and have starred in the highest rated segments several times, yet don't make as much money or receive as much screen time as the men. It took this outcry from the fans to finally make any sort of difference. It was hard to deny this is what the fans wanted and thereby what the product needed if Vince wanted the company to do well. Really had to pull that man's head out of his ass by force. His little tweet that he hears us while signaling something good and that he was listening. Goddamn brother, did you really need like something like a trend on the internet for a few days to start treating half the talent at your company as actual talent? I suppose he did. I suppose you did, Vincey. I suppose you did. 
It's important to note too that NXT was existing at this time as the developmental brand of WWE, a place that new recruits would train and perform before they'd make their way into Raw or SmackDown and basically learn the ropes of the WWE brand. And at NXT, under the guidance of the likes of Hall of Famer Shawn Michaels, the women's division were fucking killing it. They were having exemplary matches with fleshed out storylines that rivaled the men's. There was no longer any excuses for why it couldn't be like that across the main roster. Which leads us to the story of the four horsewomen of NXT. Becky Lynch, Charlotte Flair, Sasha Banks, and Bayley. The story of the four horsewomen is one that is the truly defining turning point of where women's wrestling changed for the better within WWE. Everyone I've spoken about so far in this video, and others that I haven't had time to mention, painstakingly laid the groundwork for the incredible heights these four women have been able to achieve throughout the last decade. With all four of them debuting on NXT between 2012 and 2013, they naturally came up together. And so they were constantly intertwined as they were individually hitting huge heights within the brand. In interviews, all four of the women speak about the instant chemistry they all had both inside of the ring and out of it. Something that so many wrestlers speak about constantly, that you have your best matches with your best friends because the trust is there. So from the beginning, with the talent that these four had individually, it only blossomed as you saw them find equal counterparts in the ring. And already, just as a group, they were great because they each had their own defining self-identity. All of these girls not only had their own unique look from each other, but they had defining wrestling styles, different move sets, different paths before making it to WWE. It felt like within the four of them, they were able to represent so many different wrestling archetypes. They weren't just a matching set of four Charlotte clones. Let's start with Becky Lynch, because she's my fave. Becky started wrestling in her teens and was an incredibly quick learner, having her first match after only five months of training. Coming from Ireland, she traveled around the world to pursue this dream, spending time in Canada, France, Japan, and the US. Despite success across these places, including several title runs, Becky actually retired from wrestling for six years after suffering a bad head injury before she finally started back up again and made her way to WWE. That lady literally went to clown college in her time away from wrestling. She was really just grasping at straws. And then after a questionable debut, coming out as the most cliche Irish character imaginable, wearing all green and doing a little jig, she pushed on despite and in her second week on NXT TV, we got a little taste of what was to come. Becky and Bailey vs Charlotte and Sasha. And then it just kept on coming, with storyline after storyline between these four keeping fans entertained each week as they continued to shine and, of course, developed close friendships backstage. Which leads us to Charlotte Flair. Daughter of Ric Flair, Charlotte is a generational talent, both an innate athlete with a defining 5'10 stature and with the looks that align with the divas of WWE past. It's no surprise Charlotte has been one of the most dominating figures of the last decade. Although she didn't come from an initial wrestling background like the other four horsewomen did, I mean, I can see how she might not be interested in that career path due to her closeness to it at such a tumultuous time for women with how young she was and with, you know, everything her dad went through. She did come from a very athletic background where she excelled at volleyball. But after some time and the loss of her brother, she finally decided she wanted to take her step into wrestling and it did not take long for her to get into the developmental program at NXT. I think it's easy for people to criticize her position and say that nepotism is what's got her this far, but I would have to severely disagree. She is a brilliant wrestler, a total natural, and absolutely deserves her flowers. Plus, we're not saying this kind of stuff about Randy Orton or Cody Rhodes or Roman Reigns. We don't criticize them for nepotism. We praise them for being second or third generation wrestlers. Yes, this can give you sway backstage, but provided you're going above and beyond in the ring with that sway, why shouldn't you take advantage of it? Plus, initially, she avoided using the last name Flair because she wanted to make a name for herself. Last name or not, she's a brilliant wrestler and was a hugely monumental part of the Divas Revolution and still is. On to Sasha Banks, my other favorite and for my money, probably the best wrestler out of the four with it not being surprising to hear that she grew up watching New Japan wrestling and was hugely inspired by Eddie Guerrero. 
Like Becky, she also started wrestling as a teen, taking to it incredibly quick and absolutely dominating her way across several indie promotions before moving on to WWE after only two years of performing. And it was perfect timing for her to come in. The talent around her was fantastic, which only pushed her to be even better and give her the opportunity to show off her awesome in-ring skills. And soon, she developed this Oh my god, absolutely killer heel persona, the boss. Her feud with Charlotte over this time? Legendary. I mean, you couldn't watch one of their matches without feeling the star power they both held and just know that these two would be the future of WWE. Sasha's pure talent and charisma made her one of those heels you couldn't help but cheer for. She called herself the best because she was the best. I mean, allegedly, Shawn Michaels told her that she was his favorite performer on the roster. I mean. And then in what is almost an antithesis to Sasha's badass heel character, we go on to Bailey, A natural baby face who was beloved by super fans and kids, her innate connection with the crowd can be compared to the likes of John Cena. The thing with Bailey is that her character, that of a super fan of wrestling, was genuinely real. She grew up watching WWE, attending shows and meet and greets whenever she could, and became a wrestler herself just out of high school at the promotion she had been attending shows at as a fan since she was 11. Just like Sasha, it didn't take her long in the indies to be recognized and snatched up by WWE, and soon debuted on NXT to the delight of so many young girls who saw themselves in Bailey's kind and friendly character. And stop me if you've heard me say this 50 times in the last three minutes. Bailey's in ring abilities and character work, like the other four horsewomen, were killer, and with a complete understanding of the industry that can only come from being a super fan your whole life. She quickly shut up the card alongside the rest of those four horsewomen. These women were constantly stealing the show at NXT, boasting some of the best in ring work coming out of women at WWE. Ever. And this was in their developmental program. This was seriously an era defining time. And so your watch list is about to get pretty full just from these four girls. It's safe to say that if they didn't exist at this right place at this right time, then who knows where women's wrestling would be today. I mean, honestly, you could just watch any match of theirs during this era and it'll be a showstopper. But Here's two you can count on. Firstly, their 2015 Fatal 4-Way match at NXT TakeOver Rival. Holy shit, this match was absolutely enthralling. This was history in the making. But an even bigger match happened only a few months later, one that is so highly regarded and cited as one of the greatest women matches of all time, Sasha Banks vs. Bayley at NXT TakeOver Brooklyn. Wow, the pure influence this match has had already and the benchmark that it set for women's wrestling cannot be understated. These two women tore the house down. And so it was that in July 2015, three of the four were called up to the main roster, helping to be a part of Stephanie McMahon's women's revolution and practically cement themselves as the faces of the new era of women's wrestling that was about to begin. In the ring stood the Bella Twins and Alicia Fox, Paige, Charlotte and Becky, and Sasha, Naomi and Tamina. It was clear the fans wanted this. The crowd was cheering this is awesome just from the girls having a stare off in the ring. New and old representations of the women's division together finally ushering in the way of the future. Every time I watch this segment, I tear up and I get shivers. Within 10 minutes, the entire landscape of WWE itself had changed forever. Bailey was unfortunately left behind for a little while in NXT and while she said that this hurt her, she's also said that in hindsight it only helped build her as a human being and also gave her the opportunity to take a position of leadership in the NXT locker room to help guide them all now that the girls at the top had moved on. You will not hear a single person say a bad thing about Bailey, and she is someone that has been credited by so many in improving locker room support and morale and turning it into a place of support rather than jealousy. Now, the come up for the other three wasn't exactly smooth immediately. There was still some hangovers from the Divas era, but of course there will always be some teething pains and it wasn't long until we were at WrestleMania 32 and it was time for them to take the main stage. 
This was an iconic night with Lita coming out to reveal the new women's championship that would be replacing and retiring the Divas Championship after that night's triple threat. This match was highly regarded as the best on the card, totally silencing any detractors that the women couldn't be as good as the men at wrestling's biggest show of the year, and you should add it to your watch list. There is more to come about the Divas Revolution and what that fully entailed, but we simply cannot move on from talking about NXT without Asuka taking the spotlight before we do. Wow, now this is the story of a star. Asuka came to WWE after a decade-long career of wrestling throughout Japan as one of their top female stars. Some people may question why she started then in the developmental program of NXT and not an immediate main roster debut, but that is generally because WWE has a very unique style of professional wrestling and wrestlers need to go to NXT to learn the house style. How to properly shoot a WWE-like promo, how their storylines are presented and sold, and what I can only imagine is a myriad of tiny backstage things and in-ring stuff that are just unique to the entertainment-led TV program that is WWE. So finally, in comes Asuka. She's the first female Japanese wrestler to sign since Bull Nakano in 94. In itself, that's so exciting for the progression of the company, especially considering previous stories told of Vince's racism towards the likes of Gail Kim, who is Korean. But even bigger, this is huge for wrestling fans everywhere. Joshi Wrestling, aka Women's Wrestling in Japan, has been a place where women talent has been fostered, encouraged, and allowed to shine for decades and is where a lot of the OG trailblazers for women's wrestling from the 90s originate. And holy shit, thank god did they book this right. After her hugely anticipated debut, Asuka went on to have a winning streak that started in NXT and onto her main roster debut that spanned 914 days. This winning streak included a massive 522 day reign of the NXT women's title, which she only lost because she had to relinquish the title due to an injury, with countless entertaining matches that time and time again showcased her impressive skills. To pick just one, to recommend you guys. I'd absolutely choose her bout with Ember Moon at NXT TakeOver Brooklyn 3 in 2017. The career that Asuka has gone on to have is monumental and she is still today one of the top women. William Regal wasn't wrong when he said she is quote one of the greatest champions in WWE history. The pure confidence, swagger, badassery that she exudes makes it hard to not root for her. Just watch one of her entrances as she dances her way to the ring. Oh my lord, she is electrifying. And still on the NXT train, we've got to mention Sara Amato or Sara Del Rey. Amato was the first ever female trainer at NXT and is currently the assistant head coach there. Without her, the outstanding work in the developmental scene and thereby the entire women's revolution would not be what it is. She was the first person to change the way the division was trained as she would teach the girls the same moves that the men's roster would perform and not rely on hair pulling and cat fights. Shout out to Sara for all her thankless work. So let's get back to the divas revolution of it all. I mentioned the iconic moment at WrestleMania 32 where the divas title was finally retired, and the women's championship was reintroduced in its new form. Watching Lita come out to announce this, to finally see this woman who was treated so painfully on her way out of the company just decades earlier, get to be a shining beacon of the steps forward the company were making was so special. As she said, quote, they are so much more than divas here in this ring today. They are all WWE superstars. And in the same way that the butterfly belt represented the way they saw the women in the company, this new belt did the same. It matched the men's title. It wasn't pink. It was a visual representation that both the titles, the men's and the women's, were on the same level of importance. And by the end of 2016, the title of Diva was completely retired, and the women would now also be called superstars just like the men. Here we are, finally arriving in our current era, one that I think I'll dub the golden age of women's wrestling. And I'm going to struggle to effectively cover this era properly because monumental women's matches and storylines are no longer far and few between. They are every single week, every single pay-per-view. But I will try to hit 
what I think are the most important points of each year leading up to the present day. And I will preface, I'm sure I'll still miss some. Let's dive the fuck in. Up first, a celebration for someone inside the squared circle who isn't a wrestler, Jessica Carr, who in 2017 became the first female referee signed to WWE since the 80s. A huge step in the right direction. The women's revolution isn't only for the wrestlers. People want to see women intertwine completely through the company's operation. I will criticize, because that's what I love to do. There aren't as many women backstage as you might think in comparison to how many you see in the ring. Still, the creative department is heavily dominated by men. Brian Alvarez, a notable wrestling journalist, has said that, quote, there's like between 30 and 40 people on the creative team at any given time, and the number of women is like one or two. This was said a few years ago, so there's potentially more now, but regardless, for a show that is generally now promoted as fitty fitty, men and women, it's crazy to think that most of the storylines for the women are being written by men. This in itself isn't inherently bad. A good writer is a good writer, regardless of gender. But to me, it just doesn't scream actual equality within the company, backstage where the fans can't see. And it takes me back to what Mickey James expressed about men writing her stories, which is basically, you don't know what it is to have the lived experience of being a woman, therefore you may not always know how to write a believable storyline for women. Thankfully though, I really do feel like they're writing wonderful stuff for the girls. I'd hedge my bets and say the wrestlers themselves have more say in their storylines than in the past and are able to give direct feedback to writers when something may feel a little off and have their opinions noted. I'll remind you that in the past, oftentimes the writers wouldn't even communicate with the women and would instead get other male wrestlers to be a middleman or would even punish women who would push back on a storyline. So clearly, Although they could be doing better by having more women on the creative payroll, every company could be doing better in little aspects, it seems that there's open lines of communication and collaboration in ways that they weren't previously, and they're doing a fantastic job. Seriously, like the writers are just, they're doing such a good job now, I'm so happy. Another huge moment in 2017, helping to christen this wonderful new era we're in, was the first May Young Classic. Named in honor of Hall of Famer Mae Young, an OG pioneer of women's wrestling, the Mae Young Classic would be an all-women's tournament consisting of only NXT members or wrestlers from the independent scene. Undoubtedly, with the women's revolution being ushered in by developmental wrestlers, WWE clearly saw the value of shining a light on this part of the division. You wouldn't believe how many names you'd recognize now that were a part of this tournament. Bianca Belair, Shayna Baszler, Tony Storm, Candice LeRae, Raquel Rodriguez, Dakota Kai, Kyrie Sane, Piper Niven, Rhea Ripley. And that's only nine of the 32 entrants. This was basically a showcase and a celebration of the future of women's wrestling and not just in WWE. Many of the competitors are now over at AEW having successful careers. We got to see match after match of up and coming women showing the world just what they can do and got to enjoy it with Lita on commentary. Eventually, we were at the finals with Joshi star Kyrie Sane going up against former MMA fighter Shayna Baszler. Oof, such a hard hitting match. I love when you see Japanese wrestlers fight with properly trained martial artists turned wrestlers. When they pull the classic Japanese strong style out, it makes for such a perfect matchup and you really believe that either wrestler could win, which can be an issue with booking against actual fighters. And after 12 minutes of striking, submission holds, and just pure aggression, Kyrie was crowned the first winner of the Mae Young Classic. Watching Triple H hold up Kyrie's arm, that image always makes me tear up. I love seeing the way Triple H cares and roots for all the women across the roster. He always looks like a proud dad, bringing them in for hugs after huge matches or title wins. And you can clearly see the way both him and Stephanie really love these girls in the division. Trips was always one of my favorites growing up, so it makes me just so glad to see him being such a big part of the revolution. Hmm. Anyway, sappy time over. <laughs> Seeing Shayna Baszler make the transition to wrestling from MMA was really cool in its own right. She spent time in the indie circuit, including over in Japan before making it to WWE and completely dominating the NXT division. What some might not know is that Shayna Baszler was actually a member of the original Four Horsewomen in MMA, which the wrestling Four Horsewomen were named after. 
Alongside Baszler was Marina Schaeffer, Jessamyn Duke, and you guessed it, Ronda Rousey. Potentially one of the biggest names in UFC ever, someone whose face brought international fame and acclaim to women's UFC, as well as the first woman to ever be inducted into the UFC Hall of Fame, Ronda Rowdy Rousey made the transition to professional wrestling in 2018 when she debuted at WrestleMania 34 to massive anticipation. Now, I cannot overstate the importance that Ronda joining the WWE had. Whatever your opinion of her, before, after, or during her time at the UFC, she was one of the most successful and famous women's athletes in the world. And having her face and name under the WWE brand, her star power alone helped propel the division's success at such a fast rate that I don't think we would have seen such immediate progression without her. It was only a year after her debut that women main evented a WrestleMania for the first time ever. For all reports, Ronda seemed to be liked backstage. In days past, I can imagine that her presence could have made the roster frustrated knowing that someone new was here to take the few rare spots awarded to the women. But now, I feel like it was known that having her there would only bring everyone along for the ride to the top. Many remarked that she was humble backstage as well as adapted to the art of wrestling insanely quick. Although, time and time again we saw her really struggle on the mic. Many attributed this to growing pains, but unfortunately this is seemingly something that has never improved. Ronda was renowned for being one of the first female trash talkers in UFC, so you'd think she would have brought some of that confidence and swagger like over to her promo segments in WWE, but for whatever reason, she's just never been able to. But I digress, we're talking about 2018 Ronda right now, and at this time, things were only positive for her. Just thought I'd give you the tea. And now for some dessert. In keeping up this renaissance of the women's division, it was announced that in October of 2018, WWE would be having its first women-only pay-per-view, Evolution. This in itself, an entire WWE pay-per-view, one of only a handful they do each year, would feature only women wrestlers. In the same way that the butterfly belt was a visual analogy to the way the company saw the divas, so was this pay-per-view in the way that they now saw the women superstars as wrestlers whose talent and draw can be relied upon to represent the entire company and show truly the upper echelon of wrestling talent in the world. And if I sound too excited, fuck you, it's very exciting. And just take a look at the card if you want a little more delicious representations of the eras. In the main event, we had Nikki Bella vs Ronda Rousey. The Bellas' face have been synonymous with the WWE brand for a long time. Their actions are what set off the domino effect of the women's revolution, and Nikki became the longest reigning Divas champion of all time. And she's up against Ronda, the person whose star power turned those dominoes into a fucking rocket. We have Becky Lynch and Charlotte in a last woman standing match. Two of the four horsewomen, this generation's Lita and Trish. Need I say more? Then the show is opened by Lita and Trish themselves, teaming up, representing all the groundwork they laid together, and they're up against Alicia Fox and Mickey James, two women that took the reins from them and kept going. And not to mention how intertwined the end of Trish's career and the start of Mickey's was. We had the finals of the 2018 Mae Young Classic, Tony Storm and Io Shirai, now known as Io Sky, a display of respect to the developmental scene of WWE and to the future. Just FYI, Tony Storm is currently over at AEW, carrying the women's division with her timeless Tony Storm gimmick. Mwah. Natty, Bailey, and Sasha together going up against the Riot Squad, a group of icons, two of the other horsewomen banding together to face an established stable. We rarely saw only women's stables. And the 20 woman battle royale, a mix of old and new all in the squared circle together. And the sight at the end of this pay-per-view, all the women on the roster standing at the top of the ramp celebrating. <laughs> what a historic image and moment. <laughs> now I'll be honest, I wasn't watching wrestling at this time. In 2018, I was far too preoccupied with my esports career to even be paying attention. So I went back to watch this pay-per-view in its entirety while writing this script. And I want to read out to you some of the things I wrote while I was watching high as fuck. <clears throat> Mickey Loop. 
<clears throat> Mickey moves like butter. I honestly do not think anyone moves like she does. Next one. Perhaps the audio leveling just isn't great, but man, that crowd is loud. Hard to hear the commentators. Next one. Crowd is hot. All caps. Lot of T's. Next one. LMFAO, there's nothing like the sight of an all-women's pay-per-view that scrolls through the announcement teams of other languages and it's just man's face after man's face. If you watch it, you'll know what I mean. <laughs> Every match has been fire. Doesn't feel like any have been lacking. Holy shit, Charlotte and Becky are beating the absolute fuck out of each other. Next one. No, seriously, holy shit, how are these women not dead? Next one, all caps. Oh my god, that wasn't even the main event. Next one. Wow. Imagine having to follow that. I'd be shitting myself if I were Ronda and Nikki. Damn. Ronda and Nikki going off. <laughs> Next one. Nikki really holding her own and looking strong. You'd believe it if she won. <laughs> Next. Oh my God. Even that was brilliant. What the fuck? Nikki killed it. Next one. All caps. Everyone at the top of the ramp. Shut up. I'm crying. <laughs> like actually, like, like I actually cried. I I do this sometimes. Sometimes I take an edible before a pay-per-view and if there's a really good women's match, I cry. <laughs> Just because I'm inspired, okay? Look, I cry easily. I cry easily, okay? Especially when I'm happy or inspired. But sometimes I just see them and I'm like, oh my God, they're literally making history and I'm just sitting here on my couch watching it and I love women. And then I just cry. <laughs> <laughs> Becky vs. Lita, it was last year or the year before. Ugly crying. Ugly, 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 ugly crying. Especially in the whole lead up of like Becky, like Lita being Becky's icon and like me loving Lita so much and me also loving Becky so much and then watching them fight. Uh, I, I was crying. I was like, it was bad. <laughs> this is also just a fun thing I want to mention <laughs> real quick. I love how absolutely fucked up Charlotte looks after her matches. This is how I am every time I exercise, every time I do a dance class or go to the gym. I get completely red in the face. My hair is a mess with baby hairs everywhere, like fucking everywhere, and I'm sweaty as hell. Charlotte puts on killer matches and looks like she did afterwards. So many of the other women have these huge matches and look like they haven't even broken a sweat. How does their hair stay so perfect and their faces not be beat red? No hate at all. Seriously, no hate. I am just jealous as hell. And it's nice to see Charlotte looking the way that I would after a wrestling match. Still hot as hell, but like, she's sweaty. Okay. Anyway. Anyway, Lauren. Shut up, Lauren. I really recommend adding this entire pay-per-view to your watch list. Pull up with some friends, some drinks, and watch history being made. And okay. If you can't be bothered with an entire pay-per-view, at least go watch the Becky Charlotte match because what the hell? When Charlotte is under all those chairs and you start to see them move at the seven count, I was so hyped up. Those two are such good storytellers that honestly, they had me in the palm of their hands. I can't believe the match went as long as it could. I was on the edge of my seat. But wait... Just wait, 2018 isn't done being a huge year for women's wrestling yet because baby, after fights, pleading, building, begging, finally, it was announced that the women's division were being given their own tag team championships. This is something that many women campaigned for over the years, but it wasn't until Bailey and Sasha fought extremely hard backstage to make these a reality did it finally happen. At Elimination Chamber in early 2019, we got to see 12 women inside that cage fighting to become the inaugural champs. And of course, it was Bailey and Sasha who won. Who better than to be the first ever women's tag team champs than two women with so much history, who are best friends in real life, and are two of the four horsewomen? Will these girls ever stop carrying the torch? I hope not. Now we're in the lead up to WrestleMania 35. And using Ronda's star power, WWE was set to have women in the main event of WrestleFucking Mania for the first fucking time ever. Of course, they went with Ronda and Charlotte. Who better than to represent the entire division than these two legends? But plans at WWE can change at the drop of a hat, literally sometimes last minute before you woke out from Gorilla. And in the lead up during a brawl, Nia Jax accidentally punched Becky Lynch in the face for realsies. And wow, a simple in-ring mistake that catapulted Becky to this undeniable level of stardom. 
The image of Becky closing out Raw up in the stands with blood all over her face. This simple camera shot completely altered the future of this women's revolution. After missing out on some big moments due to the injury and some further storylines afterwards where we'd see Becky lose her championship to Asuka, fans were absolutely rabid as they were desperate to finally see Becky go against Ronda. It became the hottest and most anticipated rivalry in wrestling at the time. And the WWE Universe were desperate to see this as the main event over what they knew would be a somewhat formulaic Ronda vs Charlotte. This is because there had been frustration expressed over this time period from fans that Charlotte was always somehow making her way into every single big event and overshadowing other people's big moments. For a long time, it felt like a modern day Cena wins lol. Plus, it wasn't too long prior that after a planned heel turn for Becky against Charlotte, for this exact reason, when it happened, the crowd instead cheered on Becky and saw her as the face in the story. Becky was hot. She was so extremely over. The crowd loved her and wanted to see her at the top. The Royal Rumble. Early in the night, Becky would lose her title rematch against Oscar. Hmm only to enter the Women's Rumble later that night and win after eliminating Charlotte, securing an opportunity to challenge for one of the titles at WrestleMania. And so, eventually, Becky was added into the established main event, and it was now a triple threat. A winner-take-all triple threat, because by this time, both Ronda and Charlotte held both titles. And I want to add, History was also made at that Royal Rumble by Nia Jax, who was the first woman ever to enter both the women's and the men's rumbles in the same night. Props to her. She did some good damage with the boys, taking some bumps from her, and then she got to take a super kick from Dolph Ziggler, a 619 from Rey Mysterio, then an RKO from Randy Orton. Pretty fucking rad in my opinion, but also, what a way to put her over. She needed three consecutive finishes from the men to get her eliminated. Love it. They did our good. And here we are, finally, at WrestleMania 35. As I've said a million times, the first ever WrestleMania to be main evented by women, with three of the biggest women in the company. Now, this is a match to add to your watch list. Put it on, quick. Besides it being a stunning match, this was history in the making, and it was Becky who pinned Ronda to start the reign of Becky Two Belts. And you thought she was over before. To paint a picture of WWE at the time, Roman Reigns, the current face of the company, was away from the ring battling leukemia. So there was a hole left, and as Becky's popularity soared beyond belief, she became the face of the company. A woman, and not Charlotte Flair, who on paper would be someone you'd expect to take this role with her lineage, not Ronda, who already had the star power and household name. It was Becky freaking Lynch. In 2019, Becky was voted Pro Wrestling Illustrated's most popular wrestler. Not surprising as her face was now absolutely everywhere promoting WWE, even becoming the first wrestler to be on the cover of ESPN magazine and being the first woman ever to be WWE's top merch seller across the entire company. Becky felt like a modern day leader, someone people at home watching could relate to, aspire to be. You related to her and were proud to watch her achieve against all odds. And with these heights she was achieving, it felt like her journey represented the journey that the entire women's locker room was making over this time. Becky deserves all her flowers and more, and I cannot wait to see her back in the main event scene now after winning Elimination Chamber last month, after a good two years of spending time helping build up and put over newer talent. I'm a huge fan of hers, I know, clearly. Plus, I've never been able to resist a redhead. Staying on WrestleMania, we got to see the tag team championships defended by Sasha and Bayley in a fatal four-way. Three women's titles up for grabs on wrestling's biggest show of the year? Yeah, okay, I'm in, I'm sold. In the end, it was the Iconics who took home the belts on this night. Aussie fucking pride, baby. I just love these two. Best friends who went to high school together. You can just feel the chemistry coming off them that allowed them to play a really fun gimmick. Hearing their Aussie accents on the product, amped up to a million to be the most annoying people imaginable, it's just too fun. I'm glad they got their moment. They were the first Aussies to win a title at WrestleMania ever. Honestly, 
Rhea should be thanking them for forging a path. I joke, she should be thanking Emma. <laughs> I also joke, they're all great. And now let's get a little bit negative real quick and critical because this is YouTube baby and I have opinions. After this huge moment of women main eventing WrestleMania and the initial massive advantage and hype that it was to have Ronda Rousey on the roster, things started to look negative for her. The crowd was no longer rooting for her and her inability on the mic was getting tiresome. That girl needs to slow down, enunciate, and perform her lines, not just say them as quick as possible. There can be difficulties in booking someone like Ronda or like a Brock Lesnar, boo, who come from success and a legitimate fighting background. Objectively, you know that these people could win in a real fight with anyone backstage, so they inevitably have to become these monster bookings. There's just no way they're losing matches to most people on the roster. It's not believable. And this kind of thing can eventually get old for the people watching. It doesn't help too that people were starting to feel like Ronda couldn't handle the heat of being a wrestler. It seemed that she couldn't take criticism and you saw her visibly upset at multiple moments, including when she was booed by her hometown crowd. Wrestling fans are fickle and it doesn't help that she was often being billed against everyone's beloved Becky. All right, enough Rousey. I've said this a million times, but she deserves her flowers too for what she did for the division. But I just don't think that's a face we need to see regularly in WWE ever again. Before 2019 ends, I'm telling you to add Becky vs. Sasha at Hell in a Cell to your watch list because delicious, hard hitting, 10 out of 10 match. Sasha, please come back. Congrats on the AEW deal, but Sasha. And here comes the obligatory COVID segment, because that rotten stain of a few years, as much as we like to forget, changed the landscape of normal life. And of course, a company like WWE was heavily affected. Besides the additional apparent obligatory layoffs that the multi-million dollar company was forced to do over this time, mm, WWE had to completely uphold their product model. I mentioned in the start of the video that WWE wrestlers don't just work at the weekly Raw or SmackDown shows between the pay-per-views, they're also constantly touring around the US and oftentimes beyond, putting on unaired house shows. Being a WWE wrestler is more than a full-time job. With all the travel, extra exercise, and being a part of these huge productions, most of the company is working an exuberant amount of hours each week. And then all of a sudden, with pandemic restrictions coming into place, they were no longer allowed to host live events with live crowds. So they set up shop at a production facility in Florida and began to restructure their weekly shows without a live audience, which in itself is already so abnormal, but the company ended up losing an estimated $90 million from ticket sales and in-person merch sales alone over 2020. This was such an uncanny time for wrestling. The crowd is an instrumental part of the performance. The cheering, the boos, the chants, the reactions, that immediate feedback from any move you did, any word you said was suddenly gone. Imagine winning a world championship for the first time, a moment that so many people reflect on as hitting the height of their career, and there's dead silence. No one there to witness it and cheer for you, share that moment with you, you miss out on that very special experience. It was bizarre as a fan watching from home too. The atmosphere was suddenly gone and replaced with TV screens of people's faces and piped in cheering. We saw WrestleMania 36 with no live audience. Imagine watching the Super Bowl without an audience. I cannot even imagine it. Although with this permanent venue and no audience came some opportunities to do some pretty unique stuff. Alexa Bliss, alongside Bray Wyatt, were able to lean into their supernatural gimmicks and use pre-recorded segments that naturally slid into the show, or things like production issues where their arena's audio and visuals were turned black and taken over by their supernatural abilities. The kind of stuff that wouldn't have been as easy to suspend your disbelief for and enjoy if there were a crowd of people reacting to it in real time. A bunch of people cheering with beer and signs in their hands doesn't really a supernatural horror story make. There were also some huge incredible matches over this time. Sasha and Bailey at Hell in a Cell 2020, <sighs> Rhea and Charlotte at WrestleMania 36. Now that was just a little taste of when they'd meet again at last year's WrestleMania. Whew. Candice LeRae and Io Sky at NXT Halloween Havoc, Charlotte and Rhea once again alongside Io in a triple threat at NXT TakeOver In Your House. 
Despite the lack of crowds, we still saw some ripper matches and storylines. And now, I'm never mentioning COVID again. So goodbye and good riddance. Speaking of goodbyes, only two years ago in 2022, we saw a huge moment when the current women's tag team champions of Sasha Banks and Naomi, to were the best to ever do it, walked out of the company due to disputes with creative. Prior to the actual walkout, after a match had been changed last minute previously, the two had walked out from the show and was publicly labeled as unprofessional by the commentary team for doing so. Keep in mind, this was still a time of Vince, and Vince heavily controlled the commentary team. I would not be surprised if this was just a direct quote from Vince into their ears telling them what to say, but still. What a way to publicly degrade your talent and only add heat to the fire. And then so it was, during that following Raw, WWE released a statement saying that that night, Naomi and Sasha placed their titles on the desk of then head of relations, John Laurinaitis, boo, and left the building. No one will ever really know what many things must have happened to lead up to this moment, as much as people love to speculate, but I gotta say... Props to them. They were clearly feeling disrespected and unheard, and they took a stand. And clearly, one rooted in validity, considering what we now know about the people they were directly disagreeing with. We are really getting up to date now, and I'll admit, in writing this script, I really struggled to pick and choose between which moments and which wrestlers I should mention from 2021 onwards. The division really is so fantastic now, and I feel like we're beyond that initial beginning of the women's revolution where we were experiencing firsts and big changes. This is just the status quo now. The girls are fucking fantastic and they're always given big spots on cards. So let's spend the rest of this video celebrating some of the women I haven't mentioned yet and the colossal heights they're all hitting in this golden age of women's wrestling that we're in. First, a moment for Samantha Irvin. My God, the pipes on that woman. I have been obsessed with her re-announcing work. Not only does she absolutely belt it, but she adds personality in for different superstars. It's just chef's kiss. We saw Beth Phoenix on commentary at NXT as well for a while. Ember Moon would say that she'd sometimes do a move and then immediately look over at Beth to see her reaction. I just, I think that's the sweetest. But what about the fastest, the strongest, the quickest, the roughest, and the toughest? Of course, I cannot make this video without mentioning the EST of WWE, Bianca Belair. This woman is an absolute icon and an athlete with a capital A. Coming from an athletic background, Bianca made the transition over to wrestling after being scouted by Mark Henry, and man oh man, she took to it quick. I really gotta say, this woman does not miss. Already standing out with that braid of hers that practically hits the floor, Bianca has become a huge fan favorite, especially among kids. It helps too that she's such an entertaining wrestler to watch. I love seeing someone with a huge amount of strength who can hit hard and throw people around, but is also incredibly limber as they bounce and flip around the ring. It is a deadly combo. In only a few years on the main roster, Bianca has achieved some huge feats. She is the longest reigning women's champion of the modern era at 420 days. She was ranked number one in Pro Wrestling Illustrated's top 150 female wrestlers of 2021, and alongside Sasha, were the first black women to ever main event WrestleMania. And put that on your list because God damn, those girls tore the house down and add her and Becky at the following WrestleMania 38 as well. The fans were going apeshit for that one. Did you know she makes her own gear as well? She really is the fucking moment. And now I'm going to have to take a moment to collect myself before we talk about this next woman because, oh my lord, the crush my friends and I have on her is borderline parasocial. Rhea fucking Ripley. Mommy, the best Aussie to ever do it. What an incredible success story. Beyond her wrestling chops, she has one of the most unique looks and gimmicks in the division, as well as a really innate ability to tell a story. Her work with the Judgment Day is unmatched. She can be credited with making this one of the most important stables of all time, as well as being such a huge help in turning Dominic Mysterio into the star that he's become. She made an impact at both Mae Young Classics, where WWE Universe eyes were on her for the first time, completely saw 
Award at NXT UK, where she became the first Australian-born WWE champion ever and only kept that going as she went over to the main NXT roster and was the one to dethrone Shayna Baszler's enormous reign. Before she'd even made it to the main roster too, they were booking Rhea in matches and storylines with Charlotte Flair. I mean, surely that alone tells you just how over she was. Finally, we saw someone who physically matched Charlotte. They're both tall, muscly, and have huge presences, like light and dark versions of each other. Her match with Charlotte at WrestleMania 39 last year is one of my favorites of all time. I just loved how hard-hitting and gritty this match was. And this was the start of the era of Rhea Ripley, which we are in right fucking now. Can you believe she's only been on the main roster since 2021? They literally practically built an entire pay-per-view around her. Elimination Chamber was Rhea's homecoming. It was her fucking event, as it should be. I'm so happy I got to go to that, not only to experience my first pay-per-view live, but it was just such a special moment for both Australian and women's wrestling alike, and it meant a lot, especially while I've been working on this video. I cannot wait to see where she's at in even a year's time. And once her reign as women's champ is over, I would absolutely love to see them put the Intercontinental Championship on her. Let her be the modern day China, expand on China's legacy and stories and accomplish the feats that she wasn't allowed to at the time. If anyone could, it's real. Which speaking of, can we please have a mid-card women's title? The division is incredible, but it does feel like sometimes they don't really know what to do with their robust roster beyond putting people together in the tag division. Please, WWE Mid-Card Women's Championship, please do it for me. For me. Please. Come on. I love the work that Damage Control has been doing. I love that Asuka, Kairi, and Io are in a stable together. Shout out also Dakota. New Zealand rep, they have such a huge amount of swagger and play heels so well. It'll be fun when they inevitably split up down the track and get to work against each other. I want to see some pure Joshi wrestling, please. I've loved what they've been doing with Liv Morgan. Pairing her with Rhea in 2022 was a great idea. Their looks and their gimmicks really complemented each other well. I really respect as well the spots that Liv is willing to do. I do have some gripes with her wrestling style overall. I feel like she doesn't know what to do with herself sometimes in the in-between moments and the pace can feel a bit weird, but I do still really enjoy watching her wrestle. Her sunset flip power bombs are rad as hell and the one she did in the 2022 Money in the Bank match off the ladder which literally made me pop out of my seat. And then, not to mention that cash in on Ronda later that night, I was cheering for her alone in my apartment and cried after she won. It was, I was so happy. And to quickly give Rhonda some credit, I think it was really selfless of her to put Liv over the way that she did. Obviously, Liv isn't one of the hard hitters on the roster, and so a valid 1-2-3 pin over Rhonda wasn't ever going to be believable, but I think they did an interesting job of keeping this short feud fun to watch while keeping Rhonda strong, but putting Liv over. I think that also says a lot about the quality of Liv's character backstage, the kind of person that she is, that Rhonda would do that for her. So that makes me happy. Tiffany Stratton has already made such an impact on the main roster and she's been there, what, like a month? Two? That girl has talent and personality just oozing out of her. There's no doubt she gets booked big soon because her performance at Elimination Chamber was the standout of the entire match and she was in there with veterans. I just also love that the Aussie audience loved her so much too. Honestly, she looks like she could come straight out of the Gold Coast, so it's no surprise that the Tiffy Time chants were huge. You better believe my friends and I were screaming it. I really like Indy Hartwell, not even just because she's Aussie. She has the build and the look. She definitely deserves a push and potentially a better gimmick given to her. In addition, Candice LeRae is overlooked a lot, but that girl is a firecracker with a ton of talent. Her matches against men in the Indies are really fire. You should watch them. As I'm recording this, she's just done what looks like a little heel turn against Maxine, so I'm really excited for that. You go, Candice. I think Nia Jax has been putting on some great matches since her return. I understand the flack she was receiving before she left and while she was gone. She was injuring some of the women, but it is incredibly evident that she has been working very, very hard and her actions are speaking loud for her. She's doing great work at the moment. 
I would love to see Chelsea Green get a push. She's had to reinvent herself so many times and I think she's a talent that's underutilized. She's the exact kind of person I could see holding a women's mid-card championship at this point in time. I'm excited to see what they do with Jade Cargill as well. She had such a dominant run in AEW and clearly has a huge amount of star power. I can't wait to see her eventually booked against Bianca, Rhea, Charlotte, Tiffany. Big meaty women slapping meat. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Mm. Man, that might be it. We're up to date. There's likely a million more tiny things I could mention, but I'm tired, so eat my ass. And, you know, it's time for you to stop watching this and go watch some goddamn women's wrestling, so help me God. One last match to add to your list before we go. Trish Stratus vs Becky Lynch at Payback 2023. Trish has still got it, baby. Oh, and one more thing, one actual last thing. Put Victoria in the goddamn Hall of Fame. I recognize that there are so many amazing women wrestlers who have been on the WWE roster and my not mentioning them in this video is not a reflection on them or their skills at all. This is simply just a huge video and there's no way I could fit everything and everyone in. I really tried to make this a TLDR. So even moments I did mention might have been simplified or missing details. I've made this video primarily for those who aren't diehard fans to get up to date on the lore and history of WWE so joining into their fan now is hopefully less daunting and more enjoyable because you understand the history and right now we're genuinely watching history be made. This era of wrestling right now is one that will go down in history as something incredible and I feel so fortunate to be able to be a part of it in enjoying the product, going to Elimination Chamber and watching an Aussie represent the entire company in Rhea Ripley and even just in working on this video. If there is someone you love or a storyline you remember that I didn't mention in this video, please tell me in the comments, share it with other people watching. Let's just get passionate. If I got anything wrong, also feel free to tell me because that's yummy engagement on my video and who doesn't love getting um actually on a video they've spent months working on, but also we can't be spreading misinformation out here, so correct away. If you wanna dive deeper into wrestling outside of just WWE, there are a billion and one avenues to look, but I'll give you a short list here of where to start. Shout out to my friend Huey, who has a deep knowledge of wrestling and has given me some of the suggestions here to pass on to you guys, as my knowledge outside of WWE is a bit lacking. Firstly, AEW. There's been some struggles creatively in the women's division, in my opinion, just storylines sort of going nowhere. But right now, it looks like they're really actively working on this and are getting better and better. Tony Storm's timeless Tony Storm gimmick is absolutely badass and so unique. I think the work she's doing right now is generational. Soraya, formerly Paige at WWE, is over there competing after she was told she'd never wrestle again after a bad neck injury. Athena, Diana Perrazzo, Serena D, Britt Baker. I can't wait to see where the AEW women's division is at in a year's time because I know it's just gonna grow exponentially. TNA, formerly Impact, formerly TNA, are doing sensational things with their knockouts division and have been for just well over a decade now. Seriously, their women's division is some of the best in the world. Gail Kim has done some huge things over there and is a true pioneer from her time wrestling and into her role as producer now. I'm so glad she got to go on to have a fulfilling time in wrestling after her difficulties at WWE. We got to see Jordan Grace in the WWE Royal Rumble this year, repping her knockout championship. Such a cool crossover moment. Forbidden door shit, open it up please. Thank you, Trips. Anything Joshi Wrestling, which just means women's wrestling, in Japan is outstanding. Japanese wrestling is its own thing in itself and the things the girls are doing over there are insane. Japan is where a lot of the original trailblazers for women originate and there is so much history to look at there. Aja Kong vs Manami Toyota from the 90s was celebrated as some of the most influential work and some of the best matches of all time in general. Add that to your list. Mayu Iwatani, Io Shirai, aka Io Sky, Kairi Sane, Mako Satomura, Bull Nakano, Hana Kimura too. She was a star who was taken way too young and her story is very sad but... Uh, seriously though, I'm gonna say Manami Toyota again, at Huey's insistence. In his words, she was just a revolutionary wrestler even for the whole industry back in the 90s. On the indie scene, we have Steph DeLando who is just 
breaking glass ceilings throughout the scene. She is the epitome of someone who did not let being released from the WWE contract break them and has gone on to be bigger and better than she was at the company. Her drive and commitment is very inspiring, plus she's an Aussie, so we love her. Also, she blew a kiss at me one time and now we're in love, so sucks to suck everyone else. Maki Ito is also a goddamn star. She plays this idol character who swears, gives people the finger, and cuts their heads open with a pizza cutter. I'm obsessed. More locally, I want to give a shout out to Delta. There's no way we don't see her being brought up sometime soon. That woman dominates the Australian wrestling scene and is constantly going toe to toe with the men. Her aura, her look, her wrestling abilities, it's unmatched. If you live in Australia, mainly Melbourne or Adelaide, she is performing regularly at Melbourne City Wrestling or Riot City Wrestling. You've got to buy tickets to their next show if only to see her perform. Also locally, Lena Cross. That girl has got some fight in her and I love her intensity. Once again, a tall woman who'll give you a big boot to the head and can go toe to toe with the boys. I promise you, if you just open up Google right now, there is a local indie show happening soon somewhere near you. Just have a Google for local promotions, get a ticket to the next show, and enjoy the hell out of some local wrestling. It's so exciting to see wrestling in like smaller audiences with up-and-comers who have nothing to lose. I just think the environment, the crowd interactions, the support from the local crowds, it's so much fun. It's the kind of thing you and a group of friends should do for a night out. Get a little drunk, join in on the atmosphere, cheer for your faves and boo for the assholes, and just watch some athletes do some incredible stuff with their bodies. And buy their merch after the show. Indie shows are able to do stuff that WWE can't, including things like intergender matches, and sometimes they can get a little R-rated, which is my fave. No joke, I one time saw a wrestling human centipede in a 3v3 match, bare asses and all. Like I'm not, like, like face in ass, human centipede style. It was sick. Thank you to the channel Ring the Bell who has a myriad of interviews with all WWE divas where I was able to source like a lot of my information from. If you want more women's wrestling content, I highly recommend them. Also a big thank you to Wrestle with Andy for his career history videos. If you want a more specific deep dive on a specific wrestler's career history, then go check out his channel. Stone Cold's interviews on the Broken Skull sessions are really great. He's a fantastic interviewer and really gets into some of the nitty gritty with his guests. There's also GAW, a podcast starring Mickey James, Victoria and SoCal Val, where they talk wrestling and have great guests on. The movie Wrestling With My Family is fantastic and tells the story of Paige, Nanona Soraya. The Iron Claw is fucking incredible and so, so sad. <laughs> Zac Efron killed it. Glow is such an incredible show and I will be forever mad that it got cancelled, but the seasons that are out are still so worth the watch, so run along, go watch. Okay, enough ranting, Lauren. If you've made it this far, thank you so much. If you enjoyed this, please help the channel out with a like, a subscribe, a share, or a comment, all that shit. And let me know if you want more like wrestling-based stuff, because this isn't usually what I do. This has been a huge video to research, write, record, edit, and post. I started writing this last year, but unfortunately have been dealing with some pretty bad mental health issues, ooh, including grieving my dad who passed away in July. So it's been a bit of a struggle, but I'm so excited this is finally out and people can watch it. My dad is the one who introduced me to wrestling at a very young age, so I miss him and I wish he could watch this video. So this is dedicated to you, dad, DJ Scruff. I just love wrestling so much and it's been such a wonderful hobby and escape to dive into. I look forward to every single WWE pay-per-view and local indie show so much and have so much fun with my other wrestling friends. Seeing the progression that the women's division has made is just so inspiring to me and I am not joking when I say it. Sometimes I cry when I watch women's matches because I feel overwhelmed with emotion. This isn't to say that everything is perfect. I know there's still a myriad of issues throughout the indie scenes where women aren't being given spots or are restricted to only one women's match on the card. It's fucking lame, but ultimately we still live in a pretty sexist society. And of course this still bleeds into industries that are male dominated. I think we're on the right path though, with a place like WWE proving to the world that women can fucking do it and they can do it fucking hard. Like we'll get there soon. Thank you. I love you. You will go flying over that top rope, Paul Heyman. Goodbye. <laughs> but get me started on wrestling. Boy, oh boy, somebody put a da 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 but good da for the big boys. So when you're small, yes, The Undertaker really is some sort of undead being who could be trolled by 
NXT was existing at this time is the Del... EW carrying the women's division with her timeless only stalk stalk and at NXT under the guidance of the likes of Hall of Famer Sean fucking Mike why do I keep adding in swears <sighs> do you like my shoes I'm wearing slippers okay <laughs> 